Officer Zone. Uh, my name is James Lavin, and it is under very, very sad circumstances that I bring this episode to you. I actually recorded the first 70 plus minutes of this episode five days ago, and uh, I took last week off uh, in part to record this episode early in the week and then continue on with other stuff. Um, but I've barely been able to take my eyes off of Twitter and the news um, since the dictator and tyrant Vladimir Putin chose with no reason or even flimsiest of pretexts to attack a completely unthreatening country, Ukraine and its people. Uh, He invaded, as I'm sure you are well aware, and uh, the brave people of Ukraine are fighting back and much of the world has rallied behind them. Um, I hope for the best, but I've decided to finish this episode in part because I don't want to let Vladimir Putin destroy anything more uh, that's good in the world, and in part because part of what I see in the world's rallying behind the Ukraine is technologists have stepped up and tried to do their part to, to help. And the material that I'm presenting here today, who knows, perhaps it will be of use to someone in the Elixir community to to do some good uh, there or elsewhere. So um, my heart heart is with the people of Ukraine and the refugees and all the senselessness going on in that part of the world, which affects everyone. And um, But I'm going to finish this episode uh, today. Um, the next 70 plus minutes were recorded, as I said, five days ago. Um, in the interim, I've added some a little bit of additional material that I hadn't expected to. I will be presenting in the later part of this uh, presentation um, a machine learning model with um, that basically extends something that another developer presented in a blog post. I will be extending it to a multivariate um, uh, regression as a machine learning. Uh, I will also present uh, NHL data uh, as an example, but there I will present uh, how to do matrix manipulations using the linear algebra package uh, with the uh, to, to, to calculate the regression model, um, not through a machine learning approach, but through a matrix algebra approach. So um, I hope you find this episode useful. And um, yeah, it's, uh, I will hopefully finish that today and release it. Um, but my heart is heavy and I feel bad uh, doing this now. Um, It's taken me five days to get to this point where I feel like I can even finish this episode. So um, uh, I am going to move forward now, but I pray that uh, things improve and that the world can rally behind Ukraine and defeat Vladimir Putin. Hello, and welcome back to Elixir Zone. This promises to be another way too long episode because I tried to keep it short this time and there was way too much exciting stuff to cover. So we're going to be looking today at four pieces uh, that are all focused on data and data, to some extent data analysis, but more data visualization and data manipulation um, and some data display uh, but we're not going to go for, there's a lot of other things that I'd like to cover, but it's already going to be too long. Uh, perhaps I will cover the other stuff in a future session, but I will, uh, give a overview of the stuff that I'm, I don't have time to cover, uh, before we dive into details on the stuff that I will cover. Uh, the, I remember a couple years ago, Jose Valim announced, I believe at a Elixir conf that Elixir was basically done. And uh, the major features and functionality were all there. And that from now on, sort of progress in the ecosystem would be through new libraries and, and frameworks and, you know, not in the language itself so much. And uh, many of us were sort of disappointed to hear that. But uh, several years later, maybe, th- I don't know, three years or so later, um, Jose's not gone anywhere, and what he said has proven out. I mean, there have been 
you know, somewhat, you know, not major extensions to Elixir since then. But Jose has spent um, a lot of time focusing on other uh, aspects of the ecosystem, uh, probably most prominently data, uh, data analysis. I think he has a longstanding interest in data analysis and wanted to bring some of that to Elixir, um, which has the potential to be a great language for data analysis because it is sort of concurrent out of the box and data analysis typically uh, can have tremendous performance speed ups through parallelization and concurrency. Uh, so he and his uh, band of uh, you know, creative people who surround him have developed a, a, a growing ecosystem, rapidly growing ecosystem of tools for doing data analytics and visualization. And I'm gonna give an overview of that today. We're gonna to dive sort of into the details of the data manipulation and visualization pieces. We won't go deep into the data analytics side, um, but perhaps we will in a future episode. Um, so let me begin uh, with so, by showing you some resource links here um, so that you can follow up on any of the projects that you want to pursue. Again, this will be in this will this live book that I'll be showing you today. Actually, I'll be sh probably showing you three live books today. Um, we'll uh, go into all of these areas and we'll see working code uh, for all of these things. But some resources are here on the various elements. Let me show, first of all, the, the lay of the land, sort of a high level overview of what's, what we have here. First, there's a GitHub repository called Elixir NX, um, which NX stands for numerical Elixir. And it's composed of, uh, I guess, eight repositories. And we'll be covering some of these today. Uh, we will be looking at NX, which is sort of the, the data layer uh, on which everything else is built. Um, we will be looking at Explorer, which is, as it says, data frames for Elixir. Uh, and we will, well, we'll be mentioning XLA and Axon. We won't actually be looking at them. I think Scholar is completely brand new. I think Jose may have started this days ago. Or um, side data, I, uh, I haven't looked at, um, but I did download a data set from one of the other resources, maybe you'll explore it. I'm not sure if they're related, but we'll be looking at some of these soon. Um, let's start with NX. NX, uh, you'll see, is a multi-dimensional tensors library for Elixir with multi-stage compilation to the CPU, GPU. Um, the features are here, but a tensor is basically a multi-dimensional data structure uh, that is useful. You'll see the data types um, are various types of integers and floats, and I don't even know what a brain float is, but uh, they're numerical, uh, multi-dimensional numerical data structures. And when you do like matrix manipulation, uh, that you that can be those types of number crunching uh, can be dramatically sped up uh, using GPUs. And one of the, the one of the libraries I just mentioned, XLA, is one way to dramatically speed up uh, numerical calculations using Elixir now. Uh, but that's the basic idea of NX as well is that um, it's a data structure that is tensors that can then leverage. Um, I'm not going to go deep into to NX, but as it says here, it's a subset that, that you can put numerical uh, calculations into a def N, which is, it's like DAF or def P, but it's for numerical calculations with these tensor, uh, the NX tensor data, tensor data structures. Uh, it, it, you can't run all Elixir code inside a def N. It's a subset of Elixir, um, but it's designed to be able to run very fast. And one of the ways XLA uh, works is just-in-time compilation. So it pre-compiles sort of optimized uh, routines for analyzing data. It may look at like the size of the data and figure out the most efficient way to, to break up the calculations and run them in parallel, for example. Um, we'll be looking at some details later, but it's a, a, a support for linear algebra uh, primitives. So that's like matrix manipulations, uh, et cetera. Um, inverting matrices. Um, so uh, NX uh, is a very new project. And again, as I said, all this other stuff was built on top of NX. So it is amazing that this stuff 
exists and is so well developed already because I looked up today the very first commit of NX and it was October of 2020, uh, which is, as I record this, I don't know, like uh, 16 months ago or something. Uh, and you'll see there's a 1.7 thousand stars on this project, uh, which is astonishing that this could happen so quickly. Uh, basically, there's no sort of numerical ana analytics functionality specialized in Elixir, uh, you know, a year, year and a half ago. And now I have this super long episode that's only going to cover half of what's ready for use today. Um, so Elixir, uh, sorry, Explorer, as I said, is, uh, so this is a data frame library for Elixir. Data frames, if you've ever done numerical calculations in uh, Python, for example, there's a library called Pandas, which is very uh, popular. I used it many years ago uh, to do numerical uh, uh, number crunching and data analytics in Python. Uh, and it, it has this concept of a data frame and we'll be looking at data frames uh, in this episode. Um, data frames have a small number of types uh, and these every element in a series is of that same type. So you have a series of floats, a series of integers, a series of booleans, etc. And then um, yeah, you can do various things. It's a way to structure your data so that you can easily slice and dice it, uh, manipulate it, modify it, uh, you know, analyze it, visualize it. So it's a very convenient way to explore your data, hence the name. Uh, we've looked at Livebook uh, in, a, in previous episodes. We've been using Livebook since I started the Elixir uh, uh, shows. And um, besides Livebook, uh, you'll see a couple other library sub uh, sort of repositories within the Livebook uh, uh, account. Uh, Nerves Livebook we're not going to touch today. Nerves is a, a totally separate discussion uh, for sort of Internet of Things. Um, but we will be looking at Kino today and Vega Lite. Uh, Kino, Kino, as it says here, is client-driven interaction interactive widgets for Livebook. I didn't know quite what that meant. I'm going to demo. There's a lot of different types of widgets already available, and I will demo some of those uh, now uh, or today. And Vegalite is Elixir bindings for Vegalite. So this is like a uh, domain specific language within Elixir for manipulating, uh, to, to, for using this other external library called Vegalite, which is not an Elixir library, but allows really powerful data visualization and I will show you examples of that soon. So let's start with, so look, look a bit closer at what Kino can do. So it's the library used by Livebook to render rich and interactive output directly from your Elixir code. So you can add it to your project and, and go. So let's look at some of the things that it can do. So there's various Kino widgets. So one of them is ETS, and I'll show you an example of that. But basically, you can visualize your ETS tables uh, data. Um, there's a data table, which allows you to visualize. Uh, you, you, this is like a, that says user provided tabular data, which is this. You can then call this, and it will render a, a, a visualization of that data. Uh, you can display images of all, all different kinds of binary images. Uh, you can do display markdown. Uh, you can display ecto data sets, and I will do a demo of that. Uh, you can do a frame. It's a f placeholder for static outputs. Can be I don't even know what this is. I haven't looked at that, but it's, apparently you can do animations. Which sounds pretty cool. Uh, and then Vega Lite, as I mentioned earlier, is a DSL in Elixir for interacting with Vega Lite, which is not an Elixir project. Uh, but it is super cool visualizations of data. Um, and Vegalite, here are some things, some of the API, the API docs examples. So you say, okay, I want to create a new Vegalite data structure. I want to pull in data from series of, we mentioned earlier, series of data, like a series of integers. Uh, and then you can then visualize that data Kino Visual uh, uh, Vega Lite is an extension of Vega, Vega Lite that allows data to be streamed, and I'll show an example of that here. They set up the the visualization piece of it, 
And then here they push data to it, which then gets added to the visualization. And I will demo that soon. Um, this is Vega Lite, not the Elixir repo, but the, the library that lives outside of Elixir. Um, you can see it uses a concise declarative JSON syntax to create an expressive range of visualizations for data analysis and presentation using a high level grammar of interactive graphics. And uh, it has a very rich, if you click on examples on the website, you will see a very large set of examples uh, with, uh, that you can actually try out. And I will show you how to do that. Uh, you can try it out within your live book, uh, any of the examples there. And uh, so I've taken a couple of screenshots. There are many more examples on the uh, Vega Light website. Uh, this is some of the bar chart examples. Uh, you can go to the website and click on any of these and get the JSON data, the, the, yeah, the, J, the it's all JSON syntax. Uh, it will give you the JSON syntax, which you can then paste into uh, your Kino within your live book. And you can see any of these things. Um, similarly, these are line charts. This is some of the line charts that are available to you uh, through Vega Lite. Um, there are many other things besides these two. I just took those two screenshots, but you can go to the Vega Lite website and see all the examples. Before I dive deep into all the incredible stuff that Elixir has made possible in the past 12 months or so, uh, I want to talk about some reasons you might not want to use Elixir for this purpose. Uh, there are more established data analytics platforms and they've been around a lot longer. They have larger libraries, richer ecosystems for data analysis. Uh, and you know, they probably have much heavier usage within the statistical community and data visualization community. But Elixir is coming on strong. And if you like, if, if you have all your data in Elixir already, uh, you're probably going to want to know about the Elixir ways of doing it. Um, but if, if your focus is not on Elixir, but on visualizing data and analyzing data as, uh, you know, as powerfully as possible and having access to the most libraries possible for various different ways of analyzing that data, you probably don't want to go with Elixir at the moment. Maybe someday you will, but uh, right now. So I, you know, many years ago, I, I used R when I did my economics PhD. Uh, R is a, a fabulous ecosystem for doing statistical anal analysis. Um, there's also the Python, Python community is huge, massive amounts of data analytics happens today and visualization happens within the Python community. So much so that I didn't even know which screenshots to take. This is just one library called scikit-learn that's in the Python community. Uh, here's another scipy. There are many. And I, I almost don't know where to begin explaining this. There's also, I'm not even mentioning here, there's other languages like uh, MATLAB and I think Octave. And there's a number of different other sort of specialized statistical and analytics uh, languages as well. Um, SciPy, uh, I want to note this one piece here because this is, this is really Python's weakness. As we discuss, if you watch my Erlang videos on concurrency, uh, I think I called out Python for having a global interpreter lock, along, as does Ruby, etc. Um, Python is, is pretty slow because it can only use one, safely use one CPU core uh, at a time. And uh, I think there are ways that you can try to break the global interpreter lock and do things in parallel, but uh, Python isn't designed uh, from the ground up for doing so. And so it's not very performant. So even though Python, Python, many people, it becomes their first language, especially data analytics people now. They, they learn Python on day one because it's so easy to get up and running. There's so many libraries. There's, uh, Python is a very friendly language to get started in, but it's not the most performant language. So that's part of the reason SciPy exists. It says SciPy wraps highly optimized implementations written in low-level languages like Fortran, C, and C++. So you can use the... Python is like a way to interact with these lower level languages where the actual number crunching happens. Um, similarly, Erlang hasn't been, Erlang and Elixir weren't traditionally great for number crunching either, uh, but that's sort of why NX now exists is to make it far, and EXLA, uh, make it far more performant 
because um, Erlang does Erlang and Elixir do have this uh, this concurrency out of the box. So uh, the potential is there for Elixir to be highly performant, and it has moved surprisingly well in that direction. One other language I definitely want to mention for anybody who's interested in data analytics is Julia. Julia is a very cool language. I don't know much about it, but everything I've heard is super exciting. Um, it also has macros that are in, you know, I mean, one of the things I love so much about Elixir is its macros. Julia has macros that in some ways are better than Elixir's macros from what little I understand. Um, I'm pretty impressed with uh, Julia. It's, uh, uh, I think people who use Julia love it. Um, uh, I recently bought a Julia book and I'm looking forward to digging into it, but it's definitely something that you want to know about if you're in the data analytics world and it is probably a much more powerful option today than Elixir is. So, okay, with that out of the way, um, one other thing to get out of the way is some other cool stuff in the Elixir ecosystem uh, for data analytics that I won't be covering today. I hope to come back to this someday and uh, demo this sort of stuff as well. But um, so the first thing is, well, this is not an Elixir thing, uh, but it leads into the Elixir thing. So there's a famous project called PyTorch, uh, which is for doing its open source machine learning framework. Uh, it's been around for a long time. It's very powerful, uh, relatively user friendly, I understand. Um, PyTorch, uh, you can see there's has 54,000 stars on uh, GitHub, which is rather impressive. 15,000 forks. I don't know why there would be that many forks, but there you go. Um, so this is an Elik Elixir uh, library that allows you to get access to PyTorch or Lib LibTorch, which uh, I guess is what drives PyTorch under the covers. Um, so it's a includes a backend for NX for native execution of tensor operations inside and outside of DefN. Um, but the project is currently alpha and supports only a fraction of NX's API. So I have not used TorchX. I hope to uh, someday. Um, and then there's XLA. Uh, let me go. There's EXLA is the Elixir library. Uh, what it says is it's an Elixir client for Google's XLA, which is Accelerated Linear Algebra. Um, EXLA includes integration with the NX library, uh, so you can compile your numerical definitions, anything you put inside your def n, to use the GPUs. And TPU is Tensor Processing Unit. GPU is uh, Graphics Processing Unit, I think. Um, so th there are ways to, th those are graphics, Number crunching with matrices and tensors is very similar to graphic graphical manipulations because you're like rotating triangles and stuff that I don't understand that well. But uh, it tends to be all matrix manipulations when you're rotating an object in space. The sort of things that Pixar, the movies it makes are all based on like rendering triangles and, and the shading is all based on, you know, it's all optimized through GPUs and, and I guess TPUs, which is especially, it goes beyond GPUs to optimize the performance specifically for tensors. So I, I don't understand the details, but that's the idea behind EXLA is it's dramatically more performant uh, than sort of standard uh, numerical calculations. And as one example, you can see from TensorFlow, which is another library like PyTorch uh, for machine learning, or uh, AI, sort of AI type uh, number crunching, uh, you can see that without XLA, the throughput is far less. It's like an order of magnitude less than with XLA. And if you, apparently if you accumulate your gradients, it's even faster with XLA. So I don't, I don't know the details of these things, but uh, EXLA is making possible for Elixirists to get, take advantage of this super high performance GPU, TPU um, thing that Google uh, makes possible for running TensorFlow algorithms. Um, this all continues to evolve. Uh, as I was putting the final touches on my preparations uh, this evening, I went to see the NX library. I wanted a screenshot, and I noticed that there had been a Jose Valim push to the repository just two hours before uh, I went to it. I don't know when Jose ever sleeps. I don't know if he sleeps because 
yeah, there, I mean, he's, he always seems to be doing everything everywhere at all times, and he interacts with people. I, I posted something a couple months ago in one of the Erlang Ecosystem Foundation uh, rooms, just a sort of uh, an issue that I had been having, and I think Jose replied within an hour. I, I don't know how he does this, uh, but it's amazing, and... If you ever watch this, Jose, you're, you're a hero to many of us. Uh, please don't burn yourself out. <laughs> I hope you're enjoying it because you've improved so many people's lives. Thank you. Uh, so uh, another thing I won't be getting into today is uh, this e-vision. Uh, let, me, let me start down here sort of with the what it is at, and then I'll go into the, you know, where does it come from? So there's a... Relatively new, I believe, member of the Elixir community uh, who goes by the name Coco Xu. And I think that's how you pronounce his last name. Um, it, it's XU, which yeah, he, he, I haven't had time to listen to this podcast yet, but I hope to tomorrow when I'm exercising. Uh, but uh, Coco has, I've been following him on Twitter and he's posted some, posted some amazing things. Uh, and apparently he has a new podcast uh, a couple weeks ago on Thinking Elixir that I just discovered today and I'm looking forward to listening to on Computer Vision and Elixir. This is one of the screenshots uh, from uh, a, a month ago that he got. He used Elixir and his eVision library uh, to run on Nerves, which is like an embedded device here, uh, on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, and you can't see this, but what's going on here is it's identifying the objects in this in this uh, screenshot, uh, and it's labeling them, uh, which is pretty amazing. And this is all done on a Raspberry Pi with Elixir uh, and Nerves. So um, his library is eVision, and it's using it's as it says here, it's my OpenCV Elixir binding. So he's building Elixir bindings to OpenCV, which I didn't know anything about, but. CV stands for computer vision, and there's an open CV or open computer vision library that's incredibly popular, 60,000 stars, uh, and uh, Coco is making that available to the Elixir community. And again, this is, uh, this is all like brand new stuff. It's just amazing to see how quickly uh, this numerical uh, visualization and number crunching has has taken off in the Elixir community. Uh, it's astonishing. Uh, and oh, one other, but wait, there's more. Uh, so there's another library called Axon, which is NX powered. So under the covers again, that nu the numerical Elixir foundation underlies all of this. So it's it's powered by NX, but it's neural networks for Elixir. You can build your own uh, neural network models uh, using Axon today, which is astonishing. And, uh, yeah, I hope to, you, know, you can see it's got all this thing. I mean, it's even got, it's got dropout. I, I, a few years ago, I studied this, maybe three or four years ago, I studied this stuff and it's astonishing to see all this, that all this is possible. And this is how he's building up layers of a neural network, uh, with different, like a 64, uh, node layer and a 10 node layer and, uh, 128 node layer and the ReLU activations. Uh, it's uh, very powerful stuff and it's now completely doable within Elixir and in a performant way uh, because it's using NX under the covers. Uh, so it's all amazing. So, all right, let's enough ReLU. Let's start actually doing something and checking some stuff out. So I'm using Mix install. I'm installing Vega Lite. I'm installing Kino. I'm installing JSON because I'm going to need that later. I'm explore, installing Explorer, which you'll see is still in development, uh, but it's usable. And I'm installing Ecto because I'm also going to demo some something uh, in Kino, Kino Ecto, and I need Ecto for that. So let's start with the pretty much most basic thing you can do in NX is build a tensor. So you build an NX test tensor and assign it to a variable T and displays it, and you'll see... It's a three by two tensor. It's telling you it's uh, actually I'm sure, S64. I think I think these are all integers. I think if any of these values were not an integer, everything would get turned. If everything would get turned into a float, but um, you know S probably means signed integer. So if it's signed 64-bit integer, that's my guess. 
so that's it, but it is definitely the data type here and it's a three by two tensor as you can see it's uh, it looks like a three by two uh, list of three two element lists um, there's a function called nx to heat map which draws here it's a six it's a three by two heat map just showing you the relative values and uh, i discovered this at the last minute as i was about to start recording this uh sean moriarty is i believe the the principal i think he may have started nx and he also uh is the axon he, he axon is, is his library i believe and uh he has a website and he's putting tips on here and i happened to notice this right before i started recording uh there's an nx to heat map that's where i saw that this thing existed and so i thought i'd try it out and let you know that you know you can probably get more tips from his website uh, i think he also has a book on axon and other stuff which i have uh, i've only read the first couple of chapters but hopefully i'll get to finish that and do a future video in on this sort of machine learning uh, stuff sort of a follow-up to today's video uh, you can get the shape of a tensor which you know in our case is a three by two um, and then you there are various operations that you can call so in this you can see well if i hover over nx it's going to tell me about nx the library the the module if i hover over exp it's going to tell me about the function so the function here calculates the exponential of each element in the tensor it is equivalent to math exp uh, but in in math exp as we'll see in a second does it you have to do it to each element whereas nx exp will do it to every element automatically and probably do it in a performant way maybe under the covers it's doing them I and it's concurrently or something uh, it figures out the optimal way to do it um, so in this case I, we're taking the the exp we're exponentiating everything in this original matrix so of course e to the one is 2.718 so this is e to the one this is e to the two this is e to the three this is e to the four this is e to the five this is e to the six so that's what we're getting here and to prove it uh, i just created a list of lists with the you know e to the one e to the two etc and you see the values are identical but this is done without a tensor this is done with an nx tensor uh, another heat map uh, you'll notice that the heat map now looks different i think four of these blocks are all black one is gray and one is white earlier they were different because now the relative values there's a greater variance i guess now so uh, before we had like maybe f six different colors in the heat map now the you know the extreme value is so extreme that when we do heat map we're only seeing like three different colors there at least to my eyes that looks like three colors so the shape of the the heat map changes when the shape of the data the, the values change um, then you can do operations on operations so here we're we're taking we're exponentiating every for each element we're exponentiating the element and then we're taking the sum of all the exponentials and then we're doing a division uh, again for each element so this is all happening element wise and uh why would you want to do this uh, well then that's where you want to get into machine learning if you understand the what machine learning is doing this is a common operation uh this here is the the function that it's uh oh what's it called uh i can't i think i oh i know i know i forgot the name temporarily but if i go here it's gonna i can cheat wait wait what, where did it go it's not an empty markdown oh i want to edit this softmax this is called the softmax function right I, I looked that up let me delete this before i forget about it this is this is the softmax function so that's what this is calculating when you're first looking at nx you're staring at this like what the hell is going on here this is called softmax and it's a common operation in sort of machine learning uh and then some of this stuff is incredibly performant so using exla which again is the elixir bindings for the xla library which is a google way to bind stuff and run it on gpus and tpus uh, you'll see the performance here is dramatically fast so with raw elixir you're getting like uh i don't know ips is, is that instructions per second inputs per second something but it's three so you're getting you know orders of magnitude performance gains by 
going to GPUs uh, using XLA uh, when you're doing large numbers. There's a million, you know, tensors with a million random float values. So when you have large data sets, you're going to get massive performance gains if you use XLA, which is why it's so so wonderful that the people who are developing this stuff have already made that possible. So let's move on to Kino now. Uh, Kino has a lot of different widgets. This is the widget library for Livebook. And uh, it has a lot of different uh, options. Um, here there's a Kino input widget. Uh, so I'm, I'm grabbing some text. I'm saying grab me some text and store it in who. And then down here I'm saying, okay, uh, there's an input. Let's read that input who and display it here. So if I change this, it should change. Let's see, uh, change it to Mark. Now it says, hello, Mark. So I didn't have to refresh this cell at all. There's like a binding here that figured out that the input value had changed and it just updated here. So um, this is just one type of input. I believe there are many more, but I, I didn't look into it. But you can see the sort of dynamic uh, possibilities for Livebook moving forward um, that just Kino input has. We're gonna see a lot more stuff now. Uh, so here, let's look at Kino ETS. So I create a new ETS table. If you, if you don't know ETS, I'm not going to go deep into ETS, but it's an in-memory uh, database that's just available out of the box in Erlang and Elixir. It's built into Erlang. Uh, the syntax here, I'm just using Erlang syntax. Uh, when you call an Erlang module, this is how you refer to it. You put the colon at the beginning, and it's using a lowercase name, letter usually. Uh, and then you put a dot here. If you look at Erlang documentation for ETS, you'll instead see, you'll just see ETS colon instead of colon ETS dot. And uh, that's just Elixir, the syntax is a little different, but whenever you see, let me just, uh, yeah. If, if you looked at the Erlang documentation, you'd see something like that. And you can just always translate this in the Orion documentation into this next line whenever you see it. That's how you call an Orion. So this is an Orion module with a new new function. And then this is the name of the table that I'm, I'm just choosing to give it this name. I'm saying, and then these are options. I'm saying, okay, there's different options for how you store the data inside an ETS table. And uh, I'm saying I want to create an ordered set. Um, there's a... Uh, and, I'm, and I want to name this table. So I'm saying I want to name the table so I can just refer to it as my ETS wherever I want. Otherwise, I'd have to like grab the return value here and then refer to it in the future. I don't want to bother with that. So then I'm saying, okay, ETS insert. So take insert into that ETS table I just created these this uh, tuple and then insert that tuple. And you'll see there's, there's and then I say, okay, Kino ETS, uh, display display the myats table and you'll notice there's one more value there and that's because I, I I guess I didn't wipe out my data before I did this all let me see if I can ah yeah there we go let's try this again so uh, no it's still giving me three yeah I don't know why there's an extra somehow this is remembering the fact that there are three there uh, I was going to insert this after the fact and then reload this but um, you can just add values, but the, the key point here is that there's uh, this is all a Kino widget that you can display ETS tables, any ETS table within a live book now. And there's only one page here, but it seems to have pagination as well. So uh, it oh, and there's a refresh button, it looks like, too. So I guess I can just a refresh button. Well, I guess there's nothing to refresh at this point. Well, let's let's add another value, see if it refreshes. Why not? Um, Let's add Bob, see what happens. Okay, so that worked. I hit refresh. Look at that, Bob showed up. How cool is that? All right, so so that's a Kino ETS table uh, for displaying ETS tables. Uh, now I'm gonna do an Ecto. Uh, I'm not gonna go explain what Ecto is now uh, beyond a very simplistic explanation. Uh, maybe in a future video we'll go into Ecto. Ecto has a lot of moving parts, does a lot of things from a Highest, high level perspective, it's typically the way that you interact with databases. Uh, there's something called an Ecto repo, and uh, you have data sets uh, called change sets 
that allow you to spell out all the data changes you want to make for an insert or a modification of a record, etc. And the change set doesn't interact with the database. You can keep modifying your change set, which is like a data an Elixir data structure. You just keep modifying your change set until you're happy with it and you want to submit it to the database. And then you send it to the repo and uh, either the change happens or there's an error and you know the change set comes back as invalid and, and, and you deal with it. So Ecto is the layer. It's, its main purpose is for interacting with databases. It has a lot of other features as well. It's got schemas and change sets. There's also Ecto, Ecto Multi. Uh, it's, it's a very wonderful way for uh, interacting with databases for the most part, but it, it goes deeper than that. I didn't want to have to interact with a real database here. So uh, that I sort of created some hacky code here. Don't copy this, but what I'm doing is I'm saying, I'm defining a schema, not a standard uh, Elixir, sorry, Ecto schema, but a embedded schema, uh, which I'm not gonna to store to a database. I'm saying, okay, these are the three fields, name, puppeteer, and catchphrase. They're all strings to keep it simple. And then I'm defining a, a chain set so they can pet, well, let me show you how I use it and then <coughs> we'll come back to the implementation. So here, uh, so I, the schema is saying, okay, I wanna create something uh, called Muppet. I wanna create a type of thing called Muppet and it's gonna have these three fields. So down here, I'm creating a new Muppet uh, and I'm passing in values for the three fields, name, puppeteer, and catchphrase, as we just saw, and assigning that to uh, the, 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 a variable. And so the new here is taking the map that I passed in and passing it into change set with nil. Change set is taking a maybe Muppet uh, and, uh, and the map of attributes that I passed in and then it's doing, what's it doing? So it's taking the maybe Muppet, it's ensuring it's an actual Muppet. Uh, at, so if, if the, the maybe Muppet is an actual Muppet, then it just returns it, it so that if you, if you edit them, if you're trying to edit a Muppet, you don't want to like wipe it out. You want to keep the Muppet there. But if you don't have a Muppet, in which case, in this case, I'm passing in nil here. You don't have a Muppet, so let's create a new empty uh, data data structure, <coughs> and we'll assign that to maybe Muppet. Well, we'll actually not assign it to maybe Muppet. It'll be the return value of this statement. So then. Uh, then we pass it into a function called cast, which is part of chain set. So that we're, we've imported chain set. So chain set, ecto chain set cast. Uh, what it does is it takes a, a data structure of some kind. In this case, it's going to be an empty Muppet. And the list of attributes, which in our case is a map with these values. And it's taking these this list of three things that we're going to cast. So like if we had had some other value, let's say... Um, I had tried to pass in uh, admin true, and maybe maybe there was an admin field here. Um, so, Boolean, I guess it would be. Uh, so if, if I had done that, I'm gonna comment it out just so I don't break the code, but uh, imagine it were there. <clears throat> um, I wouldn't want people to just make themselves an admin by passing in admin true. So if I exclude admin from this list, then I don't make it assignable through this. So even if somebody passes an admin, it's gonna get ignored. So that's what this list is. This is a list of, of valid things that you're allowed to cast. And anything that's not in this list will get ignored. If it comes in, it'll get ignored. And then validate required is one of the many types of validation that's possible. So in this case, I'm saying you have to pass in a, valid, a, a name. Uh, if you don't pass in a, a name field, then uh, we're, we're not going to consider this a valid thing. So then once we have our Muppet, we assign that thing to Muppet. And uh, we then, uh, part of an Ecto change set is it will create a, uh, it'll check whether it's valid or not uh, when you do validate, I believe. And uh, it, we're saying, okay, assuming that's true, then we want to apply changes. I won't go into all this, but uh, that's going to return an OK tuple with the Muppet. And so now we have a Muppet. Uh, now uh, this is even hackier code for the Ecto repo. And it's because again, I didn't want to interact with a real database. 
But what we're doing here, uh, and you can see the inspiration, I got this idea of basically building Ecto without having a database behind it uh, through this post. Um, there's a couple of callbacks that I had to define. So I, I had to define a couple of callbacks to make it work like a repo. And one of them is all, and then uh, another one was aggregate uh, to make it work with Kino. So this, this works. So what I'm doing, all I'm doing here is I'm fake, making a fake database basically with three Muppets uh, pre-populated. Uh, and then I think Kino is gonna ask me for, Kino, adds, sorry, Kino Ecto is gonna ask me for, it's gonna try to call aggregate. So uh, I had to hard code the three here. So you don't wanna write this code, but this is just to get the example, the Kino Ecto example working without actually interacting with the real database. So yeah, yeah, I created Grover there, but yeah. So then this is the this is the key step is the I then call Kino Ecto new, which is the widget that is for displaying Ecto uh, data structures, and I say okay, get the Muppets uh, from the Muppet repo, and this is what it displays. And again, it's got pagination and it's got reloading, uh, super cool stuff. Um, Kino JS. Uh, this one, I didn't build my own example. I just copied the example straight out of the um, documentation. Uh, I'll just show you how it works. I won't go into details, but uh, uh, in this case, I'm creating a new module called Mermaid so I can display a mermaid diagram or diagrams in this case. <coughs> uh, and I'm passing in, it's gonna pull the from the CDN and it's gonna initialize the mermaid uh, object and uh, call init with the graph that we pass in. The graph is gonna be down here. It's this thing that we're passing in here. Uh, and then it's gonna just render it. Um, HTML equals SVG source. So it's building an SVG and then sticking it into the inner HTML is basically what's happening. This is the graph that we're passing into this function. And uh, when you do that, you actually get a mermaid graph. So I think under the cover, I demoed in an earlier talk I showed mermaid diagrams within Livebook. Uh, presumably under the covers, it's doing something like this. So this is all super cool, but you can do other JS stuff using the same technique. Um, I, I haven't played around with any other examples, but that's what Kino JS is all about, is allowing you to uh, do stuff like this. It doesn't have to be mermaid, it can be other stuff. Okay, so let's, also, let's start looking at Explorer, which is the data frame library uh, for uh, Elixir now. Uh, there's three pieces that we're going to play with. One is Explorer Data Frame. Uh, the next is Explorer Series, and last is Explorer Data Sets. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out one of these predefined data sets and just look at it. So this is just sort of built into the Explorer library, so you can probably explore Explorer more easily. <coughs> Um, the data frame, the first thing it does is it tells you how many rows and columns there are. You'll see there's like a little over a thousand rows, 10 columns, and it lists all the columns and you see the data types of each column and the initial, I guess, five values and only displays five by default. Um, there's various functions you can call. Uh, we'll go through a few of these. One is sample. So you can say, I want a random sample of five records from the data frame and it's just showing me a list of five random values from the data frame. Uh, you can say, I wanna take 1% of all the records and see them. And since there are just under 1100 records, it gives me 11 rows is like roughly 1% of the data. Uh, so it gives me 1% of the random data selected randomly. Uh, if you wanna get specific records out, you can say which records you want um, by row number. So I picked out three consecutive. Actually, no, I didn't pick out three consecutive ones. I missed it. Why does that say, say 302? Let's see if I have to refresh this. Okay, there it is. Let's see, Guiana, Haiti, and Honduras. So that seems alphabetical order. So um, we've pulled out three different records from the data frame. Uh, you can do slicing. Uh, when you use negative numbers, th this will go to the end of the data frame. So this is basically showing the last five values in the data frame. So I guess the data set runs through the year 2014 and the last country is Zimbabwe. So that would be the last record. Let's see if the, yeah, you can see the, 
the years here 2010 they started 2010 and I guess run through 2014 in this data set uh, you can get a extract a series from a data frame so a data frame is basically a collection of series where the number of record number of um, records in each series are identical or number of elements in each series are identical and uh, so if we just want the f solid fuel this this one uh, series we can say okay give me the solid fuel series again it's in this case it shows you the data type as an integer and there's 1094 records uh, if you want multiple series uh, it will give you a data frame so it's basically this is a subset of the original data frame where we've thrown out all the series except for year and country you want to get a list of all the uh, f the, the series in the data frame called names you want the their corresponding data types you want the shape of the data uh, number of rows number of columns head gives you the first set of 10 i guess in this case five values by default uh, tail uh, you can specify a non-default value so uh, this will give me the last eight values uh, from the data set so again, these are this is all functional programming. So we're not modifying the original data frame at all. The data frame stays identical every time. We're taking a different subset of the data frame and and ret it's returning it as a new data frame. Uh, you can also filter series uh, using uh, logic. So you can say in this case, for example, give me a data frame where all the series. The, the the country record the, the the country is equal to the United States of America. Sorry. So this is this is sorry. Let me let me try that again. This is this is all the records for the United States of America. <coughs> so we're saying for the series country, the va the value has to be equal to United States of America. And you can see we have each of the years 2010 through 2014 for the United States of America. So there's five records. Um, and since we assigned that to the variable USA, we can then do data frame table on that. And this is, I believe, Kino here, uh, that it's showing the actual data uh, in the whole data frame because there's only five records and 10 columns. So we can see everything here for the United States. Uh, super cool. Uh, this is the, this is the entire, this is saying show us all the data and in this case, it's it's only showing us a very small subset. But we, we're taking the full data frame, and we're saying table. I'm not sure how to see the whole thing, but I imagine I, there must be options within data frame table that will actually. I wonder if it'll show me if I go like this. Is it going to let me? Oh, n row. Okay, so I can say n row something other than five. But if I say thirty. Let's see if it gives me 30 records. Yep. Okay, so now we have 30 records. So it's showing me all the columns. It's not truncating the columns. So it's showing me all the columns. Uh, but it gives me, I guess, five records by default. But you can specify how many rows you want. Um, Another data set that's built in is Iris, and I pulled that out here because I'm going to do some graphics on Iris uh, soon. Um, but uh, to do the graphics using Vegalite, uh, you need to use this. Uh, you can't do the graphics directly on the data frame. I'm not sure why, but you have to transform the data set uh, into a keyword list where each uh, yeah, so you can see that the so first you take the data frame and you convert it to a map, uh, then you turn it into a keyword list. The keyword list is a list of so the, the, the key the key the, the key values are the series names and then the values are the list of all the data. So this would be a thousand ninety four records or or whatever it was, and each of these fields has that. Once you have the data in this format, uh, we're assigning it here to DAT, then you can start using Vegalite to display it. Um, before I look at the iris data, uh, let's look at an example from the Vegalite website. Um, again, so we said Vegalite uh, is not originally an Elixir library. Uh, it uses JSON to define everything. 
and including the source of the data. Here there's a data set, a JSON, a cars.json data set that we're pulling out. Uh, one caution, if you are trying to replicate this uh, on any of the other examples in the Vega Lite website, uh, they use a slightly different URL here that doesn't work. Uh, you need to add, I think, this, this prefix, the HTTPS slash double slash Vega dot GitHub dot IO slash editor slash data. You sort of have to add that in. It has something else there that I don't quite understand, but I don't remember what it was, but uh, that's that you have to change that one thing. Everything else should work out of the box. Um, so this is how Vega Lite, the, the JSON looks. And so there's we're not using anything from the Vega Lite library except for the from JSON function that will then just generate the graph. So this is using Kino and Vega Lite to display, and this looks basically identical to the display that you'd see on the Vega Lite website. Um, doing the points, mark point. Oh, yeah, there's an option. We're not doing it here, but there's a mark point uh, with like, uh, you can hover over it and see the values, but that one doesn't use that. Um, uh, that's why I was surprised it wasn't hovering. Uh, you can do uh, IO inspect and see what the Vega Lite, uh, Vega Lite's an overloaded term here. So the, the Elixir Vega Lite DSL representation of that JSON uh, data structure is, it doesn't seem to have transformed it in any way, shape, or form, which is a little, it surprised me because the, uh, as you'll see soon, the DSL uses a different format and naming conventions. And there is a sort of impedance mismatch between them. Uh, and it is I, I, somewhat confusing. Uh, so like, for example, this Y offset, I'd like to do Y offset, but it wasn't quite clear to me how to do that uh, using the DSL. Uh, the DSL, the, the, the reason the DSL exists and the Elixir wrap basically it allows you to programmatically build stuff within Elixir <clears throat> without like going down to the JSON level. So there are really, it's really powerful that there is a DSL for this in Elixir, but uh, it is confusing because it doesn't match exactly with the JSON structures. Uh, I, mean, I don't know if that makes sense, but uh, we'll, we'll move on for now. So this is an example that I found from a tweet. Christopher Granger uh, was heavily involved, I believe, in creating uh, the Vega Lite Elixir library. And uh, I noticed in Twitter, he, he tweeted an example. He's, I think people are struggling with how to get data from a data frame and display it using Vega Lite. And he posted an example. So thank you for that. Uh, this comes straight from his, um, from his uh, post. Uh, so this is... So in this case, so first you, you create a new Vega, sort of display, uh, a, a way to display a Vega Light uh, graph. And in this case, we're saying it, giving it a width and height of 600 each. Then we're taking the data, that, the iris data that we had earlier, which we, tran the key step actually is not listed here. It's this, I think the thing that people were struggling with was this transformation here because they were trying to display the iris data directly, which is in a data frame format. And you can't do that. You have to transform it using these two additional steps. And once you once you transform it, then you can call data from series uh, because that's what you have now is a keyword list of series. Uh, and then you can define how you want it to be displayed. So in this case, um, we're going to say, okay, we want to mark them as points so that you know, see these are points. There's other options. And filled true, you know, I think by default, as you can see up here, they're, they're empty circles, but no, we want to fill them. So that's what this is saying. And tooltip content data. So it will display in a tooltip all the data for that element when you hover over it, which is super cool. Um, it's amazing. Uh, and then you encode your field. So encode field X, so you're defining your X here, which is pedal length. So you can see it says pedal length. And we're saying the type of data for the X field, that's quantitative data. Um, and then field Y, which will show up here is pedal width. Pedal width is also quantitative. And then, uh, so that plots out the points on the X, Y axes. And then we have sort of another axis sort of, which is the color. And we're saying, okay, for that 
we want to use the field species and that is not quantitative it's nominal there's there's like five different data type data types so quantitative and nominal are, are the ones we're using here uh, i think we'll see a few examples of the others but i'm not sure uh, but you can look in the documentation for anything that we don't cover today and it's really cool it even displays a uh, legend over here so you can see what the colors map to uh, so let's sort of build up from first principles a bit. So here I'm defining a 400 by 400 uh, graph, and I'm creating some completely predictable data. I'm saying okay, I'm defining two data series, uh, each of which is going to run from 1 to 100. And I, I left this, these comments in there from the documentation just so you can see what other options that you have here. I'm choosing data from series, but there's other ways you can do it. Uh, we're marking as a line this time, not as uh, points. And so it'll connect the, well, they're not going to be dots, but it's going to connect them as a line, obviously. And then the two fields are both quantitative. Again, it's iteration and square. So the two quantitative fields, and of course, since they each run from 1 to 100 in order, it's just a straight line from uh, bottom left to top right. So this is completely predictable, but I just wanted to show how uh, it works. And sometimes it's easier with completely predictable data. Um, here is that same set of data, except what I've done is I've added a color dimension based on the score value, which again ranges from one to 100 and is a quantitative field. And the reason I did that, I wanted to add this sort of uh, legend here. So the intensity of the color maps to the score value. So 100 is gonna have the darkest color and zero or one, I guess, one would have the lowest, lightest color. Um, there's all kinds of options. I, I've just started exploring them, um, giving you a flavor for what they do, but there's it's way richer than I've explored. Um, let's see if I can make this a little clearer here. Uh, okay, I guess you can see it all now. So uh, I'm going to create a function, uh, an anonymous function here that just generates random values. Um, well, actually, it doesn't do random values. It's going gonna, it's gonna to create the values 1 to 100, um, convert this range into a list, and then it's going to randomly sort them. So it's sorting them by basically a random number, uh, which is each element. It's, it gets a random number, and so I'm sorting based on that. So I'm just randomizing. It's still going to have the values 1 to 100, but they're going to be scrambled up completely randomly. Every time you call random values, it'll give you a different ordering of the values 1 to 100. So now we're doing the same thing. So I, I've renamed that X variable to age. Uh, I've kept the name score, but score this time, it doesn't go sequentially from one to 100. It, it's a list of values from one to 100, but in a scrambled random order. Um, you can see that's how they, they get plotted out. And again, because we're doing the color encoding for score, um, the values at the bottom which have the lowest scores are the lightest and the values at the top are the darkest because they have the highest scores. Um, <clears throat> now I'm using enum.zip uh, to basically take two different two lists of values and zip them together. So what this is going to do is it's going to so we're gonna have a list of we have two lists of random values. So previously we kept the list of ages sequential um, and we randomized the order of the scores. Now we're going to have both of these are going to, the ages and the scores are both going to be randomly sorted. Let me zip them together. That just makes it means we're going to end up with a hundred pairs of tuples or a hundred tuples, each with a pair of values, each of which is a random value from one to a hundred. And then we're going to map them. So we're going to get this, like this could be 17. Well, actually let's look at the first one. So two and 81. So age here is going to be two and score is going to be 81 and it's going to get returned as a map. Uh, which you see right here. It's a list of maps. So age scores is. <coughs> um, actually, did I even use that there? I don't know. But uh, here I'm generating the random values again. What did I do differently here? There's a reason I did this. Oh, right. So this is uh, this is to do dynamic. Dy do it dynamically. So here instead of. Um, the, the data from series is coming from random. We're going to be pushing the values uh, here. So that so d we're def we're defining this. Set. Let's see if this works again. If I there, oh, there. 
Oh, oh, I went down too far. Ah, you see the dots appearing there? So they're getting in a loop. They're getting added here. So let, me, let me try one more time. See if I can. Yeah. So now you can see that. See it more clearly. So what I'm doing is I'm defining the display, and but instead of rendering the values when the display starts, uh, we're doing this enum each for each of this age scores, which is the thing that we defined above this list of combinations of age, random combinations of age and score. Uh, we're pushing them one at a time. So this is the key thing, Kino, Vega Light, push. So we're pushing to the display, which is this thing that we defined here, the, a single score. And then we're sleeping for 100 milliseconds and pushing the next score. So there's 100 scores that get pushed, but each of them, there's a 100 millisecond delay, a tenth of a second delay between each value showing up. And this is just to simulate the fact that like if you had live streaming data coming in, you could be plotting it dynamically uh, using Kino Vegalite dot push, which is pretty amazing. Um, this is just another example of how you could create data. So data from values, these are map. It's just a list of maps. But here uh, you'll notice that we have nominal data for our X field. So we call it X A. I don't know why I called it A. That's a horrible name. Uh, so we just have two Canada's, one United Kingdom and one Latvia. And when you display it, you'll see there's two Can Canadian values and one Latvian value and one United Kingdom value. Um, and I put links, to, some of these came from uh, the examples. Uh, you can see them, um, skip that one. Uh, it's just a richer, I don't know what I, I was just exploring. I don't think this is particularly relevant. Uh, oh, here, so here I played with the aggregate. So you can do aggregation. So what I'm saying here is aggregate all the values uh, and then take the mean. So we're grouping uh, by, so A is, whatever A is, it's, we see these, there's values C, D, and E, there's three of each. Um, and we're taking the mean of the B values here. We're aggregating uh, and then taking the mean. And that's what we're plotting here. And this is a bar chart rather than a you know, pointing points or lines. Um, uh, this is daily precipitation in Seattle. We're using ticks instead. Um, here we're doing a bar chart, aggregating by count. Uh, we're doing binning. Uh, bin, bin will create bins instead of having every single value get its own thing. Yeah, I guess here we're binning by tens. Uh, you know, it, it took all the daily precipitations and binned them and then took the count within each bin <coughs> and displayed it as a bar chart. Here's a line chart of precipitation over time from the Seattle weather data, the Seattle weather data uh, over time. Uh, we were, uh, but this time we're not taking the average, we're taking the max value. Here we're taking the mean value. Uh, here's a mean as well, uh, but the time unit is year. Up here the time unit is year month. Um, here the time unit is month. Uh, and here, oh, we're doing a transformation here. So we're taking the Seattle weather data and then we're transforming it. So we're taking, so datum is a way to refer to the date, the, uh, the whole thing that's passed in, uh, or, uh, sorry, no, each element, I think of the data set. So each series will have like a hundred values and datum is saying, okay, take, take one of those values, uh, and for that value, take the max temperature and the min temperature and calculate the difference and make that the value for a new thing that we're going to call temperature range. <coughs> so we're creating a new series as uh, a calculation based off of two other existing series. And then once we've done that, we have temp range and we can plot it as the y value, the y value uh, in our chart with date as the x value. So there's a transformation. Um, there's some really pretty charts that uh, Vega Light makes possible. Um, this is, you know, I, I took an example from their website and then I tr transformed it into the DSL that is made possible through the Elixir bindings, of the Elixir Vega Light. Um, we, we saw earlier the JSON representation. This is the 
the elixir vagalite representation of that same stuff. And so some of these things I was able to translate over into the vagal, the elixir vagalite. Uh, some of the more esoteric stuff I struggled with and sort of didn't get it. I figured out some of it, not all of it. Um, uh, you can check out all the examples, but uh, this the so again we're taking a date field which is type ordinal. Oh, there's another data type ordinal, um, and we're saying the color. We're doing complicated stuff with the colors here. We're saying uh, we're going to translate different values so that the ordinal field date. Sorry, no, no, sorry, no weather type. Weather type is the yeah here weather type is the uh, ordinal uh, value so that we have sun fog. There's no way to uh, sorry, nominal value. Ordinal would mean there's a way to put them in order by, you know, call one, two, three, four, five or something. Nominal, uh, they just have names. There's no way to order them. But we're going to map each value to a specific color. So this gives us the ability to, uh, you know, make the colors whatever we want. Um, you can do multiple charts. Uh, this VL concat allows you to, to put multiple graphs together. Um, some of the stuff was a little confusing and tricky to figure out, uh, but uh, you can look at the examples. Uh, some of it took time. Uh, like this one, I'm not quite sure how I would do this in the Elixir uh, DSL. So there's some fancy stuff here that I, I couldn't quite figure out if it's all implemented or not. Or, um, I think I need more examples to be able to replicate something like this using the Elixir DSL, but it is all possible using the JSON at the moment. And maybe if you, you understand the DSL better than I do, you could replicate this as well. Um, it's just amazing what is possible. Um, not sure where I'm going with this stuff. I'm not sure what we need to. Oh, so this is this is this is here. I created this example to leverage. Um, we'll, we'll first start here. So um, there's different stocks in this stocks.csv file. And uh, I just initially chose to display Google. And then I thought, well, I wonder if I could use Kino to change which stock I display. So that's what we're doing down here. Uh, this graph is showing Microsoft stock, but it should change if I say Goog. Oh, where'd it go? Uh, I think that looks, oh, everything's get, getting re-rendered on me. So I'm losing track. I'm sorry. Yeah, that looks different. Let's try something. So I, I listed the stocks that you can do. So let's try Apple. I think Apple has a pretty high, uh, it increases pretty quick. Yeah, you can see it's spiking there. Um, Amazon. So I, I find this amazing that uh, you can dynamically change one thing and then another cell recomputes itself because it's using Kino input and then regenerating the graph based on it. Uh, super cool stuff. Um, there's some really amazing stuff that we can do in terms of graphing. Uh, I don't understand all the details of this, but VL repeat, I think, is what's allowing uh, the three different graphs here uh, to be done. You can see mean of temp max, mean of precipitation, and mean of wind. So this is temp max, precipitation, and wind. So we're repeating the graph three times, but each time we're going to use a different, uh, I guess we have repeat aggregate mean yeah i'm not i'm not quite sure how this works but uh oh yeah because we're doing mean. yeah we're doing we're repeating and each time we're taking we're aggregating based on mean so that's we have mean temp max mean precipitation mean wind um pretty complicated impressive stuff um yeah you can see i struggle i tried to replicate this using the uh, i don't know I, I guess i got it up here i tried to do something a little fancier i think uh, with another example, it didn't work out. Bar charts, uh, you can see repeat here again. It's repeating different, uh, uh, and I did columns too. If, if I did columns four, it would display this as one row with four charts, but I did columns two, so it put the four charts into two different, uh, two rows of two columns. Um, <coughs> astonishing stuff here. <coughs> this is a very rich example from that I didn't convert to Elixir DSL, but you can see that there's uh, four different things. And it's, you know, obviously if you do correlate body mass to body mass, you're gonna get a perfect 
association. So all the diagonal graphs are perfectly perfectly correlated, but the off diagonals are showing various uh, inner uh, correlations between different uh, beak depth and body mass, for example. And then the colors here are different uh, bird species, I believe. Yeah, the species is the color. Um, oh, and this is me replicating the previous example. The previous example was in JSON, and I was able to replicate it using <coughs> the Elixir DSL uh, syntax. So some of the times I could do it, uh, other times it was too tricky for me, or at least I didn't have the right enough, sufficient pa uh, patience to do it. Um, there's all kinds of graphs that you can do. You can play around with this stuff yourself. I, uh, a number of these I, I just pulled straight off of the examples in the Vegalite website. Um, they're just super cool. All right, let's stop here for the moment. I've got two more, two more try, two more live books to go through, but I'm gonna take a little break first. Um, I forgot to mention that in order to use Explorer, you will need to, there's Explorer, you will need to have Rust installed. Um, I uh, found that easy to install through ASDF, but yeah, whatever mechanism you use, you will need Rust because the numerical uh, number crunching, I believe, happens through Rust. Um, if you're not aware of Rust, uh, there's a Elixir binding to Rust, I don't know if it's a binding, but it's a, a way to, for Elixir to communicate with Rust uh, called Rustler. Uh, it's a, a library. And what Rust is, is it is, it's effectively a safe C. Um, it's, uh, C is very powerful. It's very, you know, it's a low level language that allows you to do sophisticated stuff, um, has tons of libraries, etc. cetera, but uh, it is not the safest or easiest language to work in um, because it tends to be low level uh, and uh, there's a lot of ways to shoot yourself in the foot with memory management, etc. Rust was designed uh, to be very safe uh, to use. It's still basically as fast as C, so it's highly performant, but it's a lot safer. And that's why it's being used uh, by Elixir under the covers to do the number crunching. So you will need Rust installed in order to uh, use Explorer uh, and some, maybe some of the other stuff, including NX, I believe. Uh, before I move on to the next portion of this presentation, I also wanna remind everyone that I will be posting all the code examples from the Elixir Zones on this Elixir Zone web, GitHub website. Uh, today's episode, if you go into the Elixir Live Books, uh, if you go into Elixir 103, which is this episode, uh, it's tagged with Vegalite, but you'll see um, NHL, which we'll be doing later. Um, this Vegalite 2 is the episode that, uh, uh, yeah, be, be, uh, that one. And I'm going to now go into this Exploring uh, exploring Explorer. Uh, we'll also be covering NX Regression. So let's move on to that now. So here's Exploring Explorer. Um, and as it says, this live book comes from this other uh, uh, project. So with, within Explorer, there is a live book that sort of demos Explorer. And that's, uh, that's where I'm getting this page. There's almost nothing on this page that isn't straight from this live book uh, documentation. I think this may be the only thing that I added. Um, so you can go, there may, by the time you're listening to this episode, there may be a more updated version of this. So you might want to go check out the Elixir NX Pro Explorer project uh, to, to run the latest version of this page. But just to give you a quick overview, this is a lot of the Elixir documentation now, I think is moving to Livebook because it allows you to interact with uh, the code. Uh, so it's see examples of the code, but interact with it and modify it, uh, rerun it yourself. Um, so it shows you the installation instructions, um, various options. So this is for reading and writing. Right now it says you can you can only read in uh, delimited files. So I'm loading a CSV uh, in later in this episode. Uh, there's not a lot of support for other data types at the moment, but I'm sure that's coming. Uh, it also comes with at least one built-in data set, which I'm pulling in here. Uh, this is how you just load a pre-installed data set, and this is what the data frame looks like. You can see the fields. 
Uh, there's more documentation here. I'm not going to read all the documentation. You can. I just want you to be aware that it exists, and you can come back to it uh, and rerun the, run this page on your own, or just you know visit the page on the website. Um, we we looked at Kino input, uh, so you can save. So this is we. I earlier here pulled in this data set and saved it to a data frame. Uh, you can then write the data frame to a CSV file locally, which is what I did just to see how that worked. Um, so this show, shows you functions for working with series. Uh, series, you can create a series from a list, etc. You have a list of uh, uh, date, uh, date objects or date, date data structures. Um, you get the list of the data, the, the series, you can get the data type of the series, etc. You can manipulate them in various ways. Again, I don't want to read all this documentation. You can do that on your own. Uh, it has some nice error messages. So if you try to create a list where not everything is a number, it will tell you that the, they're mismatched types. Um, so they're, they're trying to have useful error messages. Um, it implements the access protocol so you can uh, slice and dice things. You can access things like as you might imagine you can. Um, again, there's ways to see if uh, two series are equal to one another. Or uh, sorry, element, this is element by element equality. So this is telling, giving you a, it's, I think it's called a mask where uh, you basically, true or false, you know, element, element wise, are these two series equal? Um, so you can subtract, multiply, um, various reverse a list, a, a series. Um, you can sort stuff. You can take a certain number of elements from something. Um, you can do cumulative sums, rolling sums. Uh, you can get distinct values from your series. You can count the number of distinct values in your series, um, count the number of things in your series. You can create a data frame from a map. So here you have the keys being the, will become the names of the series and the values associated with each of those keys become the values in the series. Um, you can see the data frame, you can get the names, data types, shape, you can get the head, which is the, the the beginning of the the, the first uh, I guess five rows you get the tail um, you can select certain just certain fields if you want certain series from your data frame so I just want the year series and the country series you can get that you just want the series that ends with fuel it gives you the list of just the it gives you a new data frame with just the list of series that have the uh, F U E L at the end of their names um, you can yeah, yeah. Fil you can filter records here. You say, I only want the records where the country series value is Afghanistan. Uh, uh, you can filter on the year being greater than 2012. Um, again, meaningful error messages. You can mutate fields. So you can create a new column, name new column here. Uh, you can see new column down here. Uh, where it is the result of adding these two series, solid fuel and cement. Uh, you can cast a series to a different data type. In that case, float. Um, you can mutate. You can arrange things, uh, order them by a, a certain year. Uh, comes up. With, uh, let's see. You can get the distinct. Uh, yeah, just the distinct. The records with distinct year and country values. Um, can rename columns so if you want to rename you'll see year test here is in the new data frame so it's renaming the year series to the year test series um, you can rename all your series to underscore add underscore test you can add dummy variables uh, so for example if you have a year series so um, and you need very often in data analysis, you want to have dummy var variables for a year or a country or something. This allows you to do so. You can take random samples of your of records. Here you want 10 records from your data frame. Um, you want 40% of the data from your data frame. Um, uh, you can pull out the year, a single series this way or this way. You can you know, take just certain records from your data frame. 
you can slice take slices of your data frame and pivot ta pivot tables are pretty popular for various reasons um, that I won't go into now but you can do that uh, you can pivot your data as well you can join records together we'll be doing some of that I'm not going to cover this now because in the NHL data that I'm going to show you soon we will be joining data uh, frames together using this technique uh, we'll also be doing some group by but you can group your data by country for example and then do summarizations uh, you take your grouped data and then you can summarize uh, values and I will show you that as well with the NHL data so I won't go into this here um, you can range by total descending and we'll use that as well in the NHL data um, so now I want to go into this this live book that I'm showing uh, that I'm this is here NX multivariate regression this one is an extension of this article by Sean Moriarty uh, you, you can check out his article that explains how NX works and the tensors, etc. Um, then he goes into an example with basic linear regression using gradient descent. Uh, so uh, you can solve reg a linear regression problem using matrix algebra, and I will do that later. You could also solve it, um, or at least approximate a solution through an iterative machine learning approach. And so this is, and this is often used as an example of machine learning. You can solve this without machine learning, just using a formula, uh, linear algebra formula. But it's a, it's a good example of how you could also use many problems like not nonlinear function optimization problems may not be solvable using linear algebra, for example. So you may want a general solution that allows you to approximate the solution of any problem and these using machine learning and this is an example of that so even though you don't need machine learning to solve a linear regression problem he's using he's providing an example of how you could solve a linear regression problem using machine learning and it's a good example um, so, and i will replicate this and extend this so in his example uh, he he does a univariate he has a single explanatory variable here you see m times x plus b uh, so that's that's his function. We're going to do basically we're going to have two x's and a b. So we're going to have two different explanatory variables. Uh, so I'm going to take this a step further. But if you want details on his version, uh, he has annotated the code quite well, and I'm sort of extending and slightly modifying this code uh, to to a slightly more complicated example. So you can come to this for more basic. Uh, explanation of the univariate solution that he had. So, so again, this is this is the problem that he uh, documents uh, a solution for, and this is the somewhat more complicated version that we're going to cover today. But I base my solution off of his solution. Uh, what I do here is so I basically redefined his. So he creates a linear regression mob module. Uh, imports NX definition. So again, the I think I mentioned this in an earlier piece where uh, there's a new uh, type of function called a def n, which is for numerical elixir. It doesn't allow you to do everything uh, in elixir, but it allows you to do a, a subset of stuff that's possible in elixir, and but it compiles down to be highly efficient for number crunching. So that's what we're using here. Uh, and following along, I'm not going to go into all the details of how this works. I'm just going to, because you can read the article, Sean's article on that. But basically we're providing one function where uh, we're saying, okay, if you give the give me the MX and B values, uh, we're going to come up with a prediction for those MX and B values. We're going to define a loss function. We're going to be trying to minimize our loss function uh, by taking our, we're going to calculate a prediction uh, based on our current values um you know basically our explanatory our, our current guess as to the best values for these parameters and the x variable um, and uh once we get that we're going to take the actual value minus the predicted values so that's how much we're off by and this is basically taking the square of that the nx power the second power of that so we're square these are squared errors and then we're taking the mean of the squared errors. If you've ever done regression, you're probably familiar with this, where you have, you, you make your prediction, 
Uh, you look at the deviations from your prediction, you square them uh, so that basically you're giving greater weight to especially bad predictions, and uh, then you take the average of them. So that's what this loss function is doing. Uh, different types of machine learning problems will have different loss functions, but for a regression model, a linear regression model, it's going to look like this. Then there's an update function, which is basically changing M and B here are our, our, our model parameters that we're trying to estimate based on the data set that we're given. And we're trying to get the best fitting values of M and B possible given the data. And what we're doing here is we're, we're basically taking our current estimates of those. We're looking at the, the gradient of the, the loss function with respect to those variables. And then we're modifying the variables slightly to get them closer to what we think is a better solution. And then we're going to iterate over this process. Um, we're just here we're setting the initial so that we're trying to guess what or we're trying to figure out the best fitting values of M and B based on our data. And to do that, we need to start with some random guess. So this is just basically setting random guesses. Hopefully, these initial guesses turn out to not be relevant. Usually, if you have a nice, clear solution, you're going to hit it no matter what starting variables you start with. But if you have a very strange uh, function that you're trying to get to, you can get to a local minimum uh, uh, rather than a, a global minimum. Again, I'm not going to go into that, but if it's a simple problem, it probably doesn't matter much where you start, uh, what your initial s settings are. And then there's a training process where we're going to iterate uh, through n epochs, or epochs, epochs, I guess in this case, and we're going to be basically the, modifying our parameters uh, 200 times. We're going to take 200, 200 batches of data and try to tw uh, repeatedly tweak those values uh, of B and M uh, until we get them to basically the best possible values. And so, so this creates that, that module. Um, then we, what am I doing here? So this, uh, oh, so this is actually running the, the, the model. So what, what we're doing here is, so the, <laughs> So he's doing it in batches of 32 values. Uh, I pulled this, he had this embedded in here. Uh, for clarity, I tried to pull it out. The, so here, oops, it's an anonymous function. Inside this anonymous function, look at this piece. The for construct, actually let me pull up. Yeah, so here for, um, it's a, it, it generates a comprehension, it's a, a comprehension. So this code here, what it's doing, it's Elixir code. What it's doing is, it's generating a list. And the elements of the list are whatever the result of this do is. And these are the inputs that we're passing into the four. So each of these values is going to be assigned to n, uh, one at a time. And then we're going to calculate n times two. And then the resulting list is what gets returned from the four here. So, um, or as a second example here, in this list we have x1, x2, and y2, y3. So there's going to be four different combinations of these things, which is why we get four values here. In which case, uh, the, the 2 times 3 is going to give you 6, the 1 times 2 is going to give you 2, and then you get the two intermediate results. Uh, and it's more complicated. But that's what a four comprehension does. So that's what we're doing here is we're basically we're taking a list of 32 things and ignoring what the thing is. So we're just this is just to try to get 32 things out. And what is the thing that we're getting out? It's this. So each each of the 32 things is going to be a random uniform number. So rand uniform generates a value between zero and one, uh, a floating value between zero and one. And we're multiplying by ten, so we're going to end up with a value between 0, 0.0 and 10.0. Uh, and so then we're using stream repeatedly, which is going to, every time you, you pull another value from the stream, you're gonna get a list of 32 of these random numbers between zero and 10. And then we're gonna map those into this function, which is what it's doing is it's returning a tuple or a list of tuples with um, a first value of being that, that number that we calculated between 0 and 10, and the second value being 
this target function, which is the target function, what it's doing is it's basically calculating the value. Using that X value, it's calculating what the Y, the expected Y is going to be um, given your values. So here, what we have is the actual target M being 2.68 and the target B being 5.20. Um, and the data here was based on, where's the model here? Uh, done this. Let's see how this um, target M in uniform. Oh, right. So we're generating the, the target M and target B randomly. So every time you run this, you're going to get a different, let's see. Yes, yeah, so you'll see that the target M and the target B change each time through this. So this allows you to, um, and then, then once we have a target M and a target B, uh, we're, we're now going to use the linear regression train to run, to basically try to estimate those values as closely as we can uh, based on the random j data that we're generating. This data here is coming from this. So here we define uh, the ability to generate lists of 32 uh, values um, with the X and the tar in a target X. And what we want to see is that the target M and the, the, the estimated M and the target B and the estimated B are close. So let's see. It's, it's running now. You can see it's taking a little while, but it, it calculated the, was it 100 training epochs? So we did 100 epochs, and eventually it calculated a value that is very close to the actual value that generated the data. So we, we generated data using this target M and target B, and then we generated more random data uh, using the same, the target M and the target B, and then we tried to estimate what the target M and target B were uh, by, through the generated data, and we got a very close answer, but of course not identical because the it, there's some randomness there. Uh, so now we're gonna I, I'm gonna ex extend this to um, two variables. So instead of having a target M, we're gonna have a target M1 and a target M2. Uh, again, these are generated each time randomly. Uh, each time we generate this module, uh, it will generate them randomly, and uh, then we'll be calculating. Uh, everything with this extra set of variables. So let's let me just run this once. So now we've generated a target M1, a target M2, and a target B. And we generate a function to generate the sample data. Uh, what might that look like? This is one iteration of the, so there's going to be 32 of these. There's nothing special about 32. We could have done 15 or we could have done 130. Uh, he's, I'm just sticking with his example of 32, um, but we could take two of these. If we took two of these, then we'd have two sets of these. So there'd be 32 here in this list, and there's 32 more in the second list. And each of these lists is used as one epoch of the data. So if you want to run multiple epochs, uh, you could have multiple data, or you could pass the same data in each time. Um, so let me... Take a stop here for. S I hand waved through some of that because I'm going to now present again the uh, this very similar uh, analysis, but with uh, the addition of the second x variable. So um, we're now going to use m1 x1 times m2 x2 plus b. And I, uh, to be clear, b, m1, and m2 are parameters that we're trying to estimate. And x1 and x2 are uh, data values uh, in the data set that we're using to estimate the parameters. Um, so uh, before I jump into this, let me go back briefly to this section here. I want to explain this a little better. So this equation module, uh, every time it's compiled, it's going to generate these three module attributes. Um, because it's used doing a random uniform, uh, it's generating a random uniform each time. Each time you compile it, it's going to generate a different random variable. But there's going to be one target M1, one target M2, and one target B. 
And these are what we're going to use to generate the test values. So we're going to say we're going to we're going to get we're going to pass into calc data points a bunch of x1 x2 pairs. Um, and cal so th th we're going to use the x1 x2 pairs to join them to the result of do calc data points. So do calc data points uh, what it's doing is it's basically calling do calc data point and that is basically passing the x1 and x2 variables into this function here and what it's doing is we, we we've these are basically hard-coded values that we've set at compilation time for this module so all we're doing is we're using the x1 and x2 variables to generate the y this is generating the y variable um, which is the what we're um, and so when we have the so so then what we're returning from calc data points is a list of x1 x2 tuples paired with a basically y value and that's what we're when we do take here this is what we're getting we're we're doing in this case we're taking we're generating two set, two lists so each list is going to have i think 32 items in it so you see the two lists there that's where they split so that we're generating that's what the enum take two is is doing is generating two lists each list has 32 objects in it and or data structures each data structure is a combination of an x1 value and, and an x2 value as the first tuple and the second value is the basically the y value that's associated with the x1 and the x2 value so this is these were, these were randomly generated pairs all the things on the left here were randomly generated x1 x2 values and then the value on the right is not randomly generated it's using the fo the formula this formula here from target fn which is using the actual the the target m1 target m2 and target v values so this is how we're, we're using the the actual function to generate the actual values for our randomly generated x1 x2 pairs and this is the the data that we're going to use to tr to try to pretend we don't know what these values are you know the, the and and estimate them using the sample data that we're generating based on the formula so uh, and that's so then so now we're going to go so now we're going to the lin reg 2 linear re regression 2 um, let me also actually there's there's two functions i didn't talk about that i need to talk about one is this grad function i'll explain that in a second the other one that I sort of hand waved over earlier is this for here. So earlier I mentioned that there's a for loop which generates lists. And that's true, but there's an, there's an extra option here, which is this reduce. And uh, the reduce is setting an initial value for an accumulator. And then it's passing it into this uh, anonymous function as the accumulator value. And so for each of these epochs, uh, we're then going to do a reduce. So it's really putting, you could do these in separate process, separate steps, but this is using this reduce as a way to add, basically avoid doing multiple steps. Um, so this, this is from the documentation for four. It talks about the reduce option. The reduce option here, uh, as an example, so they have a list of letters that's generated with a four comprehension. Uh, and we're going to filter out we're only going to keep the values of x that are lowercase between lowercase a and lowercase z and for all of those we're going to do x we're just going to return the value so in this case we're going to be picking out the b the a the b and the c and and we're ignoring all the capital letters because they don't match this filter here um, and then so once they do that this this is just generating a list that they're assigning to letters and then they're reducing over letters, uh, doing this additional thing to transform the list of letters into a map where the keys are the letters and the values associated with them are the number of times that letter appears in the list of letters. Uh, so this, this is a totally reasonable way to do it, but it requires two steps. You can do the same thing using one step by combining the four comprehension with a reduce. And that's what's going on here. It's, it's taking the same list of uh, characters, the same filter function,
but now we're we're doing the reduce as part of basically in conjunction with the four comprehension. So we're starting off with an empty map as our accumulator. We're passing the accumulator value, which initially is an empty map, later it won't be, into this anonymous function. And then we're updating the accumulator um, with x. And the default value, if there's no x in the accumulator, if there's no key of, let's say, I guess the first value that's gonna get passed in is this b here. So this b is gonna get passed in as x. And there won't be a b key in the map so the default value will be used. So B will be get set to set to the value one. The value will be one. Then we'll get this A. There's not an A in here. So the, the accumulator at this point will just, it'll be a map with a key of B and a value of one. The second time through, and then it will get updated with this A. So the second time through the loop, there'll be a key of A and a key of B, each with a value of one. The third time through the loop, we're gonna be getting this b here and at that point well we already have a b so we're not using the default anymore we're going to call this update function so it the ampersand one will be the value of one because there's already a value of one in as the value of the b key and it will be incremented by one so then the b key ends up having a value of two and then of course we get the c so that's what this for comprehension is doing. In this case, it has a, a filter, but then combining it with a reduce. So that was the first thing I wanted to show you. Um, let me come back to this in a second. And that's where that's where we're seeing this for and this reduce, and then this big. There's a lot of stuff going on here, which I'll I'll, get, I'll go into in more detail. But before I do that, let me show you. So the NX library has a special function called grad, and I want to talk about grad. Uh, there are two versions of grad. There's a one arity grad and a two arity grad. Uh, for simplicity, let's start with the one arity grad. Then we need to talk about the two arity grad. Uh, please note that these are part of def n, not just ordinary def. Uh, what it says is it receives an anonymous function and returns a new anonymous function that returns the gradient of the input function when invoked. Uh, if you think back to your high school days of calculus, the gradient is basically the slope, the slope of the function. So when it says the gradient of the input function, what it's saying is the slope. So at any given point, like if you have a, a cur say a parabola, the top of the parabola will have a slope of zero. If the, if the curve is, is, if the line is pointing up or the curve is pointing up, it'll have a positive slope. Um, if the curve is pointing down, it'll have a negative slope. Uh, if it's flat, it'll have a slope of zero. So that's what the gradient is. And we care about the gradient because it means that we're, um, it, it helps us find uh, inflection points and max, maxima and minima. And so if you're not at a, if, if your gradient is not zero, um, you have not optimized the function, whether you're trying to minimize or, or maximize the value, you're, you have, room for improvement. If, if the gradient is not zero, it's saying you have room for improvement. So, so let's look at the example. So we're going to create a, uh, as I said, so this, this grad function takes a function and returns a function. So we're going to assign the return function to the name fun or the variable fun. Uh, what the, the function that we're going to take uh, is an anonymous function that takes a value x and returns basically and, and returns the value of sine of x, or I guess in this case it's it's because it's an nx function. It's not taking a, necessarily a single value. It could take a vector, sort of a tensor of values. Uh, so this x could be a tensor, uh, which is what we're passing in in the next line. So uh, the po the point here is uh, if you think back to your calculus days, and we'll, we'll prove this in a second, but the derivative of sine, slope is sort of another, uh, gradient is a way of saying derivative. So it, the derivative of sine is cosine. So when you take the sine function and you return the gradient of the input function, uh, you're gonna return effectively the, the cosine function. And that's what's getting assigned to fun. And then we're taking this fun, which is basically the cosine function, and we're evaluating it, that's what this dot parens does. And we're passing in a tensor with a single value of zero. 
So we're saying, what is cosine of zero? And if this is correct, the cosine of zero is one. So let's see if that's the case. I pre-computed this here. So I did math cosine of zero, and it does come out to be one. So, um, let's look uh, above this. So the formula for determining the, the gradient is to basically take the limit as uh, you take x and you take x plus a tiny little value um, and you do the derivative. So you basically, I, I wrote it out here. Um, so so th this, is, this is how you do it. So you basically, this part of it is that you take, you take your starting point. So we're, we're, we're at sine of zero. Uh, where are we here? So we're, we're looking at the function's sine and we're gonna be looking at the specific value for x of zero. So you, you, you take the value at, that you're starting at and then you take a slightly larger increment value of x. So in this case, I'm incrementing by was that one one thousandth of uh, uh, of one one thousandth, and so you then evaluate the sine at that slightly larger value of x. Subtract off the value at x exactly, and then you divide that uh, difference by the delta x that you have, so which, which in this case is 0 0.001. And what I get here is a value that's almost exactly one, which is, which is saying that the, the, great, the derivative of sine at the value of zero is effectively one. And uh, that just confirms what we saw here, which is that the, we, we, we know from our calculus days that the derivative of sine is cosine. And so if you evaluate cosine at zero, we get one, which is basically what we get here as well, which is, this is just an approximation to the actual value. Um, but that, that's, that's what's going on here. And, but the beautiful thing here is that this, this function here doesn't have to be a nice simple calcula, calculus formula or something. They somehow uh, in NX have found a way to define the gradient for any value, any, any function that you can pass in. Um, and it doesn't have to be a single value or single tensor here. It can have multiple tensors in it, which brings us to grad uh, of arity two. So with grad of arity two, oops, I keep that on there. With grad of arity two, uh, you define your variable or variables uh, that you want to different get the gradients for. Um, and then you also define your function that you want to get your gradient. The, 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 so, so basically, you're saying this is what I'm, this is what I'm trying to optimize. This is the function, and these are the the parameters with respect to which I want to optimize the value or to get the gradients. So you're saying a and b here are variables. I want to know the the derivative of this function with respect to a and with respect to b. And this function will give you that. It will give you a, it returns a function that allows you to get the derivatives with respect to both values. And that's what we're gonna be doing uh, now. I extended this uh, example from this article to handle the case where we have uh, two X values and the B value. So let's go back to this. Um, I'm gonna go through this one more time. So. These are the parameters we're trying to estimate. We actually generated, the, the sample data comes from specific values that we know, but we're gonna pretend we don't know what values generated the data. And we're gonna try to infer the values of, of these parameters from the data. So if we are given, but we have to start with some initial guesses as to what these the M1, M2, and B values are, which is what this init random params is doing. It's saying just pick some random values to start with, and then we'll iterate. We'll 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 move the 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 estimated values closer and closer to uh, something that fits the data. So we start with some random guesses, and eventually we evolve these values. But for any given guess, so the the things on the left here are guesses. We're saying okay, our current best guess of M1, our current best guess of M2, our current best best guess of B are these values, and the sample data that we're, we have at hand at the moment has an x1 and an x2. Uh, what does this imply about y? So this becomes our predicted y um, based on our actual data and our guesses as to m1, m2, and b. 
and the predicted value if it if it's close to the if these values that we're guessing are close to the actual values that were used to generate the data then this loss function will be very small it'll be minimized but if these guesses are bad this loss function will be large and if the loss function is large the the gradients are, are going to be steep uh, if the loss function is small, if we're close to, if these, the values that we're currently guessing are close to the actual values that generated the data, then the loss, the loss will be small and the uh, gradients will also be small. So here's where we're using the grad. So this is, this is where the loss function is calculating how, basically how close are we to minimizing, it, it, can we do better than we're currently doing? Uh, how, how good is our current set of guesses? And the update function is saying, okay, how should we tweak our guesses uh, to get closer to what seems to be the minimal loss function? So in this step, we're, we're, ta we're taking the gradient with respect to the parameters that we're trying to estimate uh, using the loss function, which is the thing that we're trying to minimize. And uh, this is giving us the, the gradients here, the, basically the slopes. So this is, if, if I increase my guess of M1 a tiny bit, what does that do to the loss function? If I increase my guess of M2 a little bit, what does that do to the loss function? If I increase my guess of B a little bit, what does that do to the loss function? And then based on these new updated values, we then modify uh, this. Th this is the, acu the thing that we're doing using as the accumulator. It's basically the, we're updating these guesses for M1, M2, and B, and we use that as the next round of params. Um, so, uh, so this accumulator, the init params is our wild ass guesses that we start with. And then each time through the loop, we update the accumulator. Uh, this update function here is updating the, it's returning our updated guesses as to M1, M2, and B. That's what this function call here is doing. And in order to do that, what we're doing is we're taking the data here is the this data here that we're in this case we only took two but in down here we're taking 200 so we're saying generate 200 sets of 32 data points each each set of data each data point is going to have a tuple with an x1 and x2 value and an estimated y uh, I'm sorry and and, and the, the associated y so we're, we're taking this data and we're then looping th uh, th through it um, and reducing each, each time we're updating our guesses to get closer and closer, hopefully, to the actual value. And to do that, we're, we're unzipping the data that we, so the batch is this list. So we're getting this list here. We're unzipping the list, so each for each element, we're splitting apart the first two, uh, the first part of the tuple and the second part of the tuple. The first part of the tuple is the x1, x2 values. The second part of the tuple is the y value. So we're unzipping it here. So we get the x's and we get the target, which is the y. That's what we're trying to esti es estimate. And then we're unzipping the x's, which is a list of x, y pairs, into the x the x1s and the x2s and then we're forming nx tensors out of each of these things so we get a tensor of x1s a tensor of x2s and a tensor of x of y's and then we're using putting those into the update function so this loops over and over again and hopefully gets closer and closer to the x and y values so the x the m1 m2 and b values uh, so what we can see here, let's 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 do this once. We need to so we're gonna run this. These values change. So now we have M1 is 0 0.08, M2 is 5.86, and B is 0 0.509. So let's see if we can get that. So we're gonna generate our data. Well, this is a, this, sorry, we're creating our data generator, is what this is. It's creating the data generator. This one's not actually used, so I'll skip this. Um, and then here, these values should be close, and they seem to be. So 0 0.084, what do we have up here, 0 0.084, yeah, 5.86, 0 0.509, 0 0.509, 0 0.509, 0 0.509, 0 0.509, 0 0.509, 0 0.509, 0 0.509, 0 0.509, 0 0.509, 0 0.509, 0 0.509, 0 
5.86 and 0 0.510 0.51509. So yeah, the values are very close. So this seems to be working. Um, to oh, so now I want to show you another way that you could calculate this. Everything we've done up till now is using the sort of looping and gradient approach, which is a machine learning method that has broad applicability. Uh, it's useful in a lot of situations. But in a more specific situation, you may be able to more directly get the result, the answer that you're looking for. So linear regression is something that people have been doing for many decades, and it has a clean linear, algebra, linear, linear algebraic solution. So I want to I want to show you how we can get at that. Um, so first, uh, this is how we create a tensor of x values um, if, if we do that actually let me let me just show you quickly show what that looks like when you create a tensor like this um, the first row is going to be one 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 then one two two then one three three and then one four five so that's that's what so we're just creating tensors so this is actually I should yeah um, Oh, and then the dot, what this is doing is, uh, this is basically doing x times b. If you've ever seen it in linear algebra or matrix algebra, when you have x, which is, in this case, it's what, a 4 by 3 matrix, and you're multiplying by a 3 by 1 uh, matrix, uh, you're going to get a 4 by, four by 1 uh, result. And that's what this dot, the nx dot is doing, is it's multiplying this, the x and the b together and getting a 4 by 1. Um, there's a formula, uh, did I put it in this? No, I put, let me, let me jump to this next live book because I put it in here. I want to show you the, I, I, I should have moved it. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, there should be a math equation in here somewhere. There we go. Okay, so, so this, yeah, this is what I want to show. So in this case, uh, we have two data points. We have a y1 and a y2 are the result, the thing that we're trying to estimate. So let's say this is uh, housing prices. So this is the price of the first house. This is the price of the second house. This might be the number of bedrooms. This, this column here represents the number of bedrooms. So the first house, how many bedrooms does the first house have? How many bedrooms does the second house have? This might be um, how... Uh, how many bathrooms does the house have? How many, how many bathrooms does house one have? How many bathrooms does house two have? And this value of one here is simply because some things may be universally true. Like maybe maybe every house in the town is worth $100,000 just for the land alone. So the bathrooms and bedrooms don't matter. Every house is going to be worth 100000 just for the, the dirt that it sits on. Uh, and then the way the matrix, matrix multiplication works is, so we're, we're saying that, okay, we think we can estimate the, the, the value or the price of the first house through these three factors. And the way that we're going to use this formula where we're going to multiply the first column by B1, we're going to multiply the second column by B2, and we're going to multiply the third column by B3. And so the price of the first house is going to be equal to b1 times 1, which is b1, plus b2 times x1, 1, and b3 times x2, 1. Um, I should probably name this differently. But uh, and the second, the estimated value, the, the value of the second house would be b1 plus b2 x1, 2, uh, plus b3 x2, 2. And, and these are just errors. These are assumed to be random errors because you're never going to get the exact value of everything out of this. But this is the model. And in a real world data set, you'd have many more rows than this. This is just stylistic and you probably would have more variables as well. But this is the stylistically what it is. And then you can put this into a matrix formulation by naming this thing on the left Y. Uh, usually it's uppercase Y. Naming this matrix X and then this matrix B or beta and then this is just the errors are epsilon. So these are all vectors or matrices now. And then 
it's been calculated, and you can. You, I had to prove this out when I zoomed economics PhD forever ago. That uh, this is a formula for estimating the value of beta under certain circumstances. I should have made this beta, not b. But um, this is an estimate of b based under certain assumptions about how the errors work, and and every. And it won't work in all situations, but if under Reasonable circumstances, uh, this formula will give you the, the estimated values of B here. So in, the, in this equation, uh, everything except the Bs uh, is data. Well, I guess, it, yeah, yeah, this is, this is data. Uh, sorry, this is data. The Xs and the Ys are all data. The Bs and I guess the Es are sort of estimated uh but what we're trying to do is we're, we want to estimate B, that we want to know, you know, how much is a house with no bathrooms or bedrooms worth? How much is a house with an extra bedroom worth? How much is a house with an extra bathroom worth? Or it could be, you know, square footage or, you know, age. I mean, there's all kinds of variables. This is obviously not a complete example, but stylistically, that's what we're looking for. So now I'm going to, I'm going to show you now how to do this calculation inside of nx so this is x prime x uh all invert inverted so x prime x inverse x prime y that's what we're going to do now just uh, remember that mnemonic there x prime x inverse x prime y so here i'm calculating x prime x um, which is a dot product between x prime x prime means x transpose so this is taking the x uh tensor and transposing it and then it's multiplying it by x. That's what the dot is doing, is it's doing matri matrix multiplication. So this is x prime x, and then this is x prime y. So we're taking x prime means x transpose. So we're transposing x, then we're multiplying it by y. And then to get our beta hat, which is our estimates, we're saying we're multiplying two things. We're, 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 we need to invert x prime x because we have x prime x inverse in this case it's it's an nx dot linear linalg function uh, and then once we have x prime x inverse then we multiply by x prime y and that should give us our beta hats um, let me run that uh, see if that so this is basically two five seven and, let's, and that if you look that is what we use to generate uh, the the, the data, 257. Um, and then, so now I, tr I turned it into a function that I can use to do bivariate regression. Uh, so basically, you can see here the stuff that we just did. You know, I'm taking the tensor and I'm transposing it to get x. Uh, what are you doing? Oh, oh, so I'm passing in an x tensor, well, a list. So I'm passing in a list of data. Sorry, let me respeak. This will allow me to pass in any list of y's, any list of x1's, and any list of x2's. And when I pass in those lists, if if the lengths match, because there's no point, it, it doesn't make sense if they don't. If, if we pass in a list of x's, x1's, x2's, and y's, um, we can create that list of ones. Remember, there's a matrix of ones. We just take the, the length and we create a list with however many elements we need all set to one. So that's gonna be x zero, which is what we're gonna to use to estimate the B value. Uh, and then we have the X, we're gonna turn the list of, so we take the x zero, x one, and the x two lists that we have and turn it into a tensor. And then we're gonna transpose it. And that gives us our X, uh, x matrix. And then we're going to take the Y list and turn it into a tensor. Now, once we do that, we're all set to do exactly what I just did a minute ago, which is take the transpose of X and then take the invert of the X prime X and the X prime Y, the multiplied by the X prime Y. And that gives us our beta hat. And uh, once you have that, you can then get your Y hat, which is your predicted, your predicted values for each of the uh, data points. Um, by multiplying x times beta hat. So, and then we're gonna return it as a map. We're gonna say, okay, we're gonna return, let's run this, see what we get here. Well, this, this is just defining the regression model. We haven't actually run it yet. 
but uh, now we, we run this. So for we I generated this data based on this formula. So unsurprisingly, we're going to get values back that match it. But um, th this is just a proof that it works. So in this case, here's beta hat. So these are the, the values we used to, or I used under the covers to generate this list was, I said two times x1 plus five times x2 plus seven. That was the formula I used to generate the data. And then I used the formula to check that the results match. So we should get two for x1, five for x2, and seven for uh, b. And that's what we get. We get two, five, and seven. Those are our estimated beta, or x1, x2, and I guess x0 values. And then the estimated observations are 14, 26, 38, and 57. And uh, if, if you multiply each of these rows by these values, you're going to find that, that that works out correctly. So I'm then going to take this regression function. I'm going to use it later uh, down here. So we'll come back to this. It actually it gets a little more complicated because in the actual data set, I'm going to show it with uh, there's null values. And so first we have to get rid of all the data observations that have any where any of the things that we want to use in our regression equation are nil. So there's extra complication there. So we'll come back to this. But um, yeah, this is near the end. But I want to present the rest of the NHL uh, data first, and then we'll, we'll eventually get back to this. After I finished recording everything, including the last section, which I haven't you haven't gotten to yet on NHL data, uh, I thought I was done. I packed up my light and my microphone and thought I was done, and then realized I had this additional section to present. So I set up the light again, and I re-recorded this section that I'm about to do, and then realized I didn't re-plug in my microphone. So I'm re-redoing this section now, uh, squeezing it in before I cover the NHL data, because I realized there's one more live book that I prepared but have not presented. So for this live book, uh, which uh, is, using, is about this plot math library or module that I created, um, I'm going to use Kino and Vegalite. The, um, the purpose of this module is to plot a function, any function uh, of a single variable uh, for like mathematical functions, um, not computer functions, just math functions. As an example, um, here uh, we're going to pass in the sine function into this uh, plot fun function that we're creating here. Um, <laughs> originally there was no sleep milliseconds. I added this uh, afterwards to show how this works. There's a, one of the reasons I created this was to demonstrate this piece of logic right here. So instead of just plotting all the data directly, um, what we're doing is we're creating a, basically a plottable Vega light uh, space, which we're then calling widget in this case, so we can just call it whatever you want. And then we are pushing data to the widget using this Kino Vega light push function. And in this case, we're going to be pushing XY maps with XY values in them. And then it, it's going to be plotting the XY values into the, the widget that we defined. And then sleeping for sleep milliseconds, which by default is one, but we can slow things down by creating a larger uh, sleep milliseconds value just to, to, to plot this out. But this is to sort of simulate data coming in from a data feed, like a stock ticker or something like that, um, to show how you can dynamically add data. So let's try running this first. You can see it's, it's generating the plot there. And it is a sine curve. Um, the you know, sine of zero is zero. The, and you'll notice that this this math sign. This is from the Erlang. There's an Erlang math module, and it has a sign function. And you'll also notice that it's. Uh, I thought I saw documentation. Yeah, the math module. So there's documentation for the math module. Uh, and there's module documentation for sign, but there's not really a lot here. It just tells you. It returns a float 
and it's expecting x to be a number um, but that it, that's better than we had before so there's a little bit of uh, documentation for these Erlang modules and functions which is very cool so um, the way this works so we're gonna alias Vega light is VL we define four module attributes uh, default precision uh, is basically saying how many data values do you want to plot between 0 and 1 between each integer between 0 and 1 1 and 2 etc in this case I'm defaulting to 10 so we'll print 0 0.0 0 0.1 0 0.2 etc um, we're sleeping for one millisecond we're defaulting to a minimum x value of minus 2 pi and a maximum x value of 2 pi. All of these values are overridable through opts. Um, you can pass in opts in this function into this plot fun call <clears throat> and that will override the defaults. So this is how we define the widget. Um, we're going to plot x, y pairs. Um, the way we come up with this, we first need to calculate the x's. <clears throat> so we use the x min, x max, and precision values to generate a list of x's that we want to plot. Um, and that's defined here. I'm not going to go into the, the math, I, the, 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 the function calls here, but it will, for example, if you say, if, if you make this call call uh, calc x's from uh, minus 2, minus 6.2, 6.2 and 10 it will return this list it'll return this as a list <clears throat> minus 6.2 minus 6.1 all the way up to 6.2 <clears throat> so this is my voice because i've talked too much today and uh so at that point so this returns a list of all the x's that we want to plot and then it passes them into calc x y's so the first Value there will be a list of all the x's, and the second uh, argument there is fun, the function that we want to plot. So calc x y takes in the list of x's and the function we want to plot. It takes the list of x's and maps them into uh, calc x y. Calc x y takes the each x it takes an x value <clears throat> and the function, and it then tries to find the y value associated with that x value uh, according to the function uh, if it can do so if it can call fun uh, and evaluate fun at the value of x then it will assign that value to y if instead something goes wrong uh, the value of y will be set to the error uh, atom and so then we return for each value of x that we try to plot we'll return a map with x set to the x value we passed in and y set to either the y value that we calculated as fun of, fun of x or as the error uh, atom. And then we can then filter out, that allows us to filter out the x, y pairs where the y value is equal to error because we're not going to be able to plot those because they're probably infinity or minus infinity and we don't want our y axis going up or down that high or low. So we're going to just exclude those xy combinations from the plot. So we attempt to calculate everything, all the y's associated with the x's and any that we can't, we just throw away that x value and don't plot anything there. So then we can use this function to plot things, uh, various functions, math cosine, math tangent, etc. And you'll notice that some of these values would go to infinity if we plotted every single point, um, but we choose not to plot every point. Uh, when it gets very, very close to the value that would lead to infinity, uh, it will be a very large or small, very small number. But uh, if it, we actually pick the exact value that would lead to an infinite value, we just exclude that from our data set and don't attempt to plot it. And that's why we can plot these functions that do not have, um, that don't, don't have values that are, that include X values that lead to non-plottable values. Um, you'll notice that the, the library, the, the math module includes a lot of useful math functions like the log, natural log function, the exponential function, um, uh, 
Yeah. So the second take this the square. This is how you square something. Um, this is the cube. How you cube a value. Uh, take the fourth power of something. So that, that's the, the only the, the the only reason I want to show this is I wanted to, sh to um, demonstrate that you can um, plot points dynamically using this push, and uh, so that that was the point of this exercise. Well, this is really turning into a marathon session. I'm. Uh, uh, if anybody's gotten to this point, congratulations. Uh, hopefully, you enjoy this last section. I think uh, there's a lot of good stuff here. So uh, first, the data that I'm going to be showing now is from this Kaggle uh, data set or data set that's available on Kaggle. Uh, it's on NHL games, NHL being National Hockey League, if you're not familiar with that. We're going to be using Vegalite, Kino, JSON, and Explorer. Uh, and to reduce typing, I'm aliasing data frames as DF, series as S, and data sets as S. Uh, this is a picture of what the data the data set looks like uh, at a table level. We will not be using all of these tables. I've actually only downloaded three of them. One is team info. Uh, team info gives a team ID. We're going to use the short name, team name abbreviation. So I think it's like Boston, Bruins, and BOS is the abbreviation. Uh, we're going to be using game team stats and game. So game is what it suggests, there's an away team ID and a home team ID. Uh, those match to the team ID here, but because they have different names, we're going to have to rearrange things to make these data sets, the tables uh, connect to each other. We don't have access, at least I don't think we have access to traditional SQL type stuff. So to make the data sets link up, we're going to use uh, a different approach. Uh, so each game has, you know, the number of goals scored by the away team and the home team, the out outcome, which is a string of like home team wins and regulation or something like that, has a date time uh, when the game was played and the season. I think those are the main fields that we need in the game ID, of course, is the primary key. And then there's a join table uh, with game teams and stats. Um, a game is going to have two teams. One will be the away team ID and the other will be the home team ID. Uh, so a game will have two game team stats records. One, each will have the same game ID, but one of the team IDs will be the home team ID here and the other will be the away team ID here. And uh, we're going to be looking at like shots, goals. I think this is penalty minutes. Uh, hits. Uh, we won't be looking at that one. I think maybe power play opportunities I might have used. Um, and whether they won or not, uh, HOA is home or away. So because there's two teams playing, and there's going to be two records here per game. There's going to be one, t one team will have HOA home and one will be HOA away. And that will potentially allow us to connect up to the away team ID and the home team ID. But we'll get to that. So first, uh, I, I'm not doing it here. You, you need to download the data from Kaggle. Uh, I put it at this location on my local computer and I'm reading it in as a CS, CSV file using the data frame read CSV uh, function, um, which returns a tuple, an OK tuple, and oops, I don't want to do that. And uh, so this is what it looks like um, it's 26,000 rows, 15 columns. Game ID, you'll see it gives the data type integer, date, time, GMT is a string. We're going to be manipulating that so that we can make use of it. Uh, outcome, as I said, home run and regulation, away win and overtime, etc. Venue we're not going to use, but that's the, those are the main things we're going to use is uh, season, game ID, and date, time, and the away team and home team IDs, and away goals, home goals. Um, so now I, what am I doing? I'm saying, oh, so this is, I'm going to create a series because the date time here, sorry, the, yeah, the date time here is a string formatted like this. Uh, we need to convert it into something that we can use rather than a string. Uh, here I've converted into a list of date times, uh, data structures. 
and there's other ways that we can do this, but I'm using the naive date time from ISO 8601, uh, just mapping the whole list in that way. And then for each of these, there are going to be some nulls, perhaps. I, I forget why I did this, but um, there was a, sometimes I get an OK tuple with three values, and sometimes I get with two values, and just uh, you can do a case statement that matches on uh, multiple different types of possible responses. Uh, at one point, I was getting unprocessable. Oh, unprocessable. This is, I use this for debugging. I don't think you actually need this. Uh, I have an issue there. Um, I'm using the data frame mutate function here to take this new date time series that I created, uh, which, which is a date time rather than a string, and create a date time GMT field, uh, which is replacing this date time GMT field since I named it the same thing. Um, so we're just replacing that, and now you'll see that the date eh, where go uh, the date time. GMT is now a date time data structure uh, series. You can do data frame table, which will show you the whole list of games. Well, it shows you the re you know five records by default, but you can see all the fields, and you can specify options if you want to see more fields. I'm now reading in the team info data table um, gives sort of summary information here. Thirty only thirty three rows because there's approximately that many teams. I think there were one or two teams that didn't exist through the whole data set or where they moved. Um, here's the list of teams. Uh, since there are 33 records, I said, show me all 33. And you'll see there's there's one here, the Atlanta Thrashers. Any of you who know the NHL, uh, you may not be familiar with the Atlanta Thrashers. They existed for a while. I think they became the, uh, the moved to Canada. I can't remember the one of the Canadian, t oh, let's see if I remember it. it was the, uh, not the Canucks. It was the, um, I can't remember now. doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't matter. The, this is how you, if you want to take the data frame and use it to do, to generate uh, graphs and tables using Vegalite, you can't use it, the data frame directly. You need to convert it to a map uh, or, yeah, and then convert the map into a keyword list. And that's what we have here. We have a list with key value pairs, the key being each of the variables and the values being lists of all the observations. Um, maybe in the future you won't need to do this conversion, uh, but for now, apparently you do. Uh, this is, oh, this is a way to see the full names of the teams and the abbreviations. Uh, I'm not going to go through all this, but, you know, zip and map and you can play around with that head of teams. Uh, if you want to just pull out certain series from the data frame, you can do that. Uh, I did that so they could name this thing abbreviations because I'm going to use that to join stuff. Uh, and you can see all the abbreviations. Um, what I use it for, so I took abbreviations and I renamed team ID to home team ID and I did it again to generate away teams, renaming team ID to away team ID. And then I re renamed uh, abbreviation to home team. So this would allow me to join on records based on the home team ID. And this would allow me to join on records based on the away team ID. Or if you remember earlier, the games, each game record had an away team ID and a home team ID. So um, to join, so that's what I'm doing here is I'm taking the games, which to refresh your memory, the games data looks something like this. So there's a game ID, and then each game has an away team ID and a home team ID. So what I'm doing now is I'm joining those tables together. Once I have this away teams, the home teams and away teams abbreviations, I then take the full list of games and I join it to the away teams and then I join it to the home teams. And then I calculate a new field uh, mutation, the new field being called home team diff. Uh, actually, I'm not sure if this is correct because there's 26,000 records here. Oh yeah, that's right, yeah, I think that worked. Yeah, I think that let me join properly because I, yeah. Um, yeah, I create a new field called home goal diff 
where I'm subtracting off the home goals from the uh, the away goals from the home goals. So if we have away goals of four and home goals of seven, then the home goals diff should be three, as it is here. And you'll notice also now we have away team. So now the away teams are listed and the home teams are listed. So by doing those two joins, we, we join once with the home teams and once with the away teams. And now uh, we have these extra columns that we didn't have before. And we also created this home goal differential uh, field that we can then plot or do whatever we want. Um, so I'm going to use the group by. So I'm taking the data frame that we just created. Um, again, we, because it's Elixir, data is immutable. So if you modify games, you can't just use game, the modified version of games. You have to reassign the games uh, uh, variable to the updated version of games, which we did here. So we then take that updated version of games. We group by home team, and then we do data frame summarize. Uh, so I'm summarizing home goal differential, the min, the max, the min, the mean, and the max, and the number of unique outcomes, outcome being home. This isn't really meaningful. I just want to try out n unique, but the number of uh, different outcomes of like home team wins in, in overtime or whatever. So there's, because we group by home team and there are 33 teams and every game, every team played at least one home game. There are 33 rows in this data set, you know, one for the Anaheim Ducks, etc. cetera. Um, this is our, so when we say outcome n unique, it will create a field called outcome n unique. Similarly, home goal differential mean is gonna have a home goal dif differential mean uh, uh, field in the resulting data set when we call summarize, that's how summarize works. So now for any given team like the Anaheim Ducks, we can see that their home goal mean differential was positive 0.305. So they tended to score 0.3 goals more than their opponents at home. You can see that the Arizona Coyotes, they on average lost at home by a fraction of four or five hundredths of a goal. Um, the max home goal differential, etc. So you can summarize data, but you can group and then summarize data. Now, I typically use the live book to explore, uh, exp to play around with the data. And then once I have a sense of how everything works, then I try to create modules and functions uh, that automate away some of the thinking. And so that's what I did here. So I created an NHL.games module and I created module attributes for the where the data lives and then i'm saying okay create nhl games from raw data and if i don't pass in any values it's going to use the default values there so first it's going to read in the game data it's going to convert the date time gmt which is sort of similar to what we did before then it's going to read in the team's data it's going to do this abbreviation. It's going to select just team ID and abbreviation, do the, the create the stuff that we, so this is basically automating the stuff we did before. And it's going to join the home and the away teams and create that other field. So this is just automating in one function call, everything we did manually up above. And that's a very common use pattern with uh, live books is you want to play around with things. And then once you feel you understand how they work, you then want to go and make it more formal in a, in a module or in functions. <clears throat> I also define some uh, masks. So what a mask is, is if you have a data data frame, each series has say a thousand records in it. Um, you want a list of true false that indicate whether something is true or not. That's, that's like a mask. So like if you wanna know if the record represents the home team or not, uh, sorry, data, oh sorry, in this case what I'm doing is I'm saying okay, Get, so get the home team series, and then whatever team of I pass in, let's say it's BOS for Boston, um, then check is the series, the series home team equal to BOS? And that will return a new series of true false values. So wherever the home team is boss or Boston, it will say true, and wherever the home team is not Boston, it will be false. And then we're going to convert that to a list. 
<coughs> I found that useful to do uh, when I was playing around with the data. I think after I figured out how things worked, I didn't need the mask directly anymore. I was able to directly filter the games. So, cause that's what I was really trying to do is filter home games and filter away games. So here, what I'm doing is I'm taking the full data set and I'm filtering out uh, things where the home team series is equal to whatever team abbreviation I was looking for. So uh, now we call this create from raw data and we get the 26,000 records with 19 columns because I think we created three new ones. The I think the three we created are away team, home team, and home goal differential. Um, this is more playing around, just uh, become, became not too useful, so I commented a lot of it out. But like if you wanted to get the Boston home games, you'd say games, and then you could pass it through this filter home games boss. Um, and then you just have a data frame with just the 900 records from Boston's home games. And you can similarly do Boston away games. Same fill it here. There's 905 away games and 917 home games. Don't know why it's not more precisely accurate. Uh, to use Vegalite, we want to uh, give it an alias so it's easy to do. This data frame concat rows. So what I did was I, I wanted all the Boston records, um, but because there's two different columns where Boston could be, it could be the home team or the away team, I pulled them out separately. And then I want to basically create a bigger data frame that, that just basically puts all the rows together so that you have that these two have to have all the same columns, but then you can just stack the rows on top of each other. So now I have all 1,822 Boston games, whether they were home or away. If we go down here, you can see, I guess, because we stacked them, the first records are all going to have Boston as the home team. The second half of this data set will presumably have uh, the away team all being Boston. <clears throat> so uh, now, actually, I, should, oh, I thought I had run all this. Let's see if this even works. Okay, so this is uh, creating a graph. So this is our first graph. So what am I doing? I'm saying take all the Boston games. Pull out the date time GMT and the home goal differential. And I need to, oh, so this is an unfortunate thing. I think that over time, uh, the data, the libraries will get better and better. Um, as of now, uh, when I tried to plot with date time, it did not like that and did not work. So I have to cast the series uh, from a date time to a date to get this to work. Uh, probably in the future, uh, that will no longer be necessary. But I wanted to plot this with, um, as you can see, it has the date along the x-axis and the home goal differential along the y-axis. Uh, but it only worked with date, did not work with date time. Um, and again, as I said before, you can't directly display, you can't graph the data frame directly. You have to convert it first to a map, then to a keyword list, which is what's going on here. So this boss is now usable in Vega Lite. And then so we're saying in, in Vega Lite, uh, then we, oh, and then I was, I, I couldn't even use the, the date directly either. I think I had to cast it to a string. Yeah, so when I, the, when I, so I took the date time and I converted it to a date and then I had to convert the date to a string and that worked. Um, that's what I needed to do. Um, again, it may get easier in the future, but for now that's what needs to happen. So then I say, okay, I wanna create a Vega Lite graph with a height of 600 and width of 1200. Um, we're going to take the data from this data set that I prepared already, and we're going to make we're going to mark everything as points, and we're going to have the x field based on the date time GMT field, which we've cast to a string, and uh, that is type temporal, so it's showing it. You know, there's different types of data that you can plot, and the y value home goal differential is quantitative data, and that's what this is. And in this case, I did not, let's see if I, I think there's an option. Well, we'll be doing it later, but uh, let's see if I can remember what it is. Uh, I'll, 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 it's coming up. I'll have an example down below. Um, this is just picking out a, a particular year. You see when I'm filtering the data, equaling the season, just this one season. And it looks like it's formatted this form. I think this is Elixir formatting. So the season, is an integer in the data set. It's 2018, 2019. I'm not sure why it's not a string or something else, but that's what it is. And I think if I auto format, which on my computer is 
shift shift alt f it auto formats that it thinks it's an integer and integers can be formatted like this in, in elixir that looks really weird but that's what auto format is doing for me um, and then so we're using this revised data set that's just a single season and plotting it the same plot and that's what we get uh, and you can see each of the games oh here you can see it pops up all the data associated with each of these uh, games which is pretty cool and that's through this tooltip so when i mark it as a point i then say tooltip content data and then if i mouse over it it will show me the actual data from the game which is very cool um, skip this stuff first and so my son was like what was atl and my son knows all about <laughs> hockey so he didn't know what it was so i said well it's probably because it's old data and so i looked at the what's the first and last records in this data set and it starts in 2000 which is long before my son was born which is probably probably why my son didn't know about the atlanta nhl team so uh to do this i i did sorted the series and then i printed it out to a list or i saved it as a, i saved it to sort it as a list <clears throat> and then i just did list first and list last on the sorted list um outcomes this is also just i don't know actually i don't think i even used this did i use this Let's see if i use this oh i did yes so this is, this is oh yeah this is kind of interesting so here so what i did was i just generated a list of all the outcomes and plotted them and uh what you see here is that away wins in regulation is substantially lower than home wins in regulation so this is the home the home home ice advantage is this basically um, interestingly there doesn't seem to be much of a difference in overtime the home and the away teams like, it looks like the home team might have a slight advantage in overtime but uh the regular regulation there there's a big difference i guess it's just under nine thousand wins for away teams in regulation and a little over eleven thousand wins for home teams in regulation Oh, this is another graph this is plotting out what do i have here i have away goals away goals and home goals aggregated uh the si uh, so the size of this is how many cases there are um so bigger circles represent more data and then i've colored this based on a home team so uh actually i'm not sure this even makes sense now that i'm thinking about this uh I was sort of playing around with this. I'm not sure if this even makes a lot of sense. But, so this is Boston only data. Oh, okay. Yeah, this doesn't make a lot of sense. But I think BOS being the home team uh, in a lot of these graphs. So this is all the Boston data. There's 38 Boston games that ended in a uh, where Boston was the home team and they won by a score of four to two. So four to two, there were 38 such games. And then if I go into this, uh, I think, yeah, there's a, these little circles are um, where Boston, I, I'm not sure quite what this is, but <laughs> it, it, there, there is a way to plot larger, uh, to aggregate things and plot them based on size of the circle. And, uh, and you can also colorize fields. So in this case, home, home teams are colored a certain way. But I think I meant that to be home and away. I didn't think that through too well. Let me, so what is this here? So this is a full data set. Uh, so right now, so I'm joining an extra data set now. So we have the game team stats. So previously we had games and we had teams. And now we have game teams. So there's the third table here that we're merging in along with the others. And... Uh, so now we're going to have twice as many records um, as a home mask where we look at the home teams and the away teams, the away mask and the filtering of home and away teams. Uh, so now we have this much larger data set because there are, um, there are two, two teams per game. Um, this is all the keywords. All keywords is, so this is, doing the trick where we could convert the data frame to a map, then to a keyword list. Um, and 
I had to drop this field because it was a date or I think it was a date time that was causing some of the analyses I tried to do to blow up. Um, so by dropping that from the keyword list, uh, things started working and I'm not, again, I think it's just a glitch in the libraries at the moment, but we still have, where is it here? I think we still have, yeah, we still have season. Oh, and we still have the string version of the date that I generated earlier. So we know the day that this happened as a string, which I was able to plot as a temporal variable, but I had to drop this series from the data frame where things didn't work properly. So let's let's just plot some of this stuff out and see what we get. I thought I had already pre-plotted pre this stuff, but I guess I hadn't. Um, I did nothing. Pre oh, there we go. Uh, so what are we doing here? Oh, this is penalty minutes against goals and whether the team won or lost the game. So so they won. So teams that scored a lot of goals uh, tended to win. You can see that the, I don't know, is that amber color is very high at the bottom. And the teams that didn't score any goals, they always lost, which totally makes sense. And, you know, is there a trend toward teams getting more penalty minutes losing? I think there might be, There's, but uh, not hard, easy to tell. These these graphs were sort of these. I made this to explore the data. Uh, I'm not really trying to prove anything out here, but you can see I'm taking the size is the the count. So larger bubbles here indicate more teams or more game more team game combinations in that in that range. But this is plotting penalty minutes, which is a quantitative field, sorry, quantitative field against goals, which is also a quantitative field. Uh, let's try running some more of these. Oh, I wish I had pre-calculated this because it's going through 63,000 records or something, but um, I'm not sure. Some of these are not thought out too well uh, in terms of like what they're actually demonstrating. Uh, let's see. Oh, this one's a little, you see, can sort of see a trend here, I think. Um, t and yeah, it would be nice to pr plot a regression line or something. Uh, I did not get around to that, but uh, you could easily see a regression line going up and to the right. It seems the more shots you take, the more goals you tend to score, which totally makes sense. And uh, you'll see that the, the blue circles mean the team lost and the Amber circles mean they won. And so most of the teams that scored a lot of goals won uh, their games. Uh, all the teams that scored no goals lost all their games. And it looks like taking more shots, you tend to get more goals, which totally makes sense. Um, oh, this is an interesting one. So here what I'm doing is, so we have, well, let me look at the, the axes. So you have shots taken, so it goes from no no shots to, to 88 shots, and penalty minutes. So and then the probability that you won. So the darker the the blue means the higher the probability of winning. So teams that took a lot of shots had a high probability of winning. Most of these are dark blue. Teams that took few shots um, tended to lose. And then there's a big sort of gray area in the middle here. Um, and is there a tre trend for teams that took a lot of penalties to lose the game? I don't know. It's a little hard to see, but there are a lot of uh, yellow dots up here. But I'm not sure it's really showing you much, but I'm, I'm not really trying to analyze hockey. I'm really trying to just play around with the data set. So, um, but yeah, again, the, the way this works, we're aggregating the mean. So the way I calculated this variable is by aggregating the mean. So we were bucketing the data. Um, where's the, let's say, you were aggregating the mean of the one. So if there were two, if there were two values or, or 10 values with the same number of shots and penalty minutes, uh, we would be taking the mean of them to calculate this, uh, color. So that's where these non, you know, obviously the, most of these that are either zero or a hundred are probably just single games and all the empty space here are games that didn't have that exact combination of uh, penalty minutes and shots. Um, but down here, there's a lot of games, I assume that had, you know, 33 shots and 
17 penalty minutes. And so that's why there's a intermediate value here. It's it's somewhere between between strictly between zero and one, not not at the boundary. Oh shoot, I just did that. Um, so here I'm grouping by home team. Oh, so I'm looking in this example. What I'm doing is I'm looking for each of the home teams. What was their home goal differential on average? And you'll see that the that not too long lived team from Atlanta did not. They, they got outplayed at home a lot. Um, I'm proud to say that my Boston Bruins look pretty good in the score. They tend to score more than a half a goal, more than the other team when they're playing at home. And then the next chart is uh, looks even better for my Boston Bruins. This is the away performance when, you're, when Boston's the away team. Uh, they still outscore their opponents by a little over uh, 0.2 goals a game. So they're the only team in the data set that actually scored more goals on the road than their opponents. So that's pretty cool. Um, so here I'm, yeah, just, I'm not sure what I'm doing here. Uh, There's just different ways to calculate the data. Do I actually use it for something? Here it looks like I do. Ah, yeah, this is a pretty graph. So this is the home goal different differential on average and this is the away goal differential uh, and we do it by teams so and then the mouse over this is the Vegas Golden Knights they were quite good especially at home scoring basically seven and a half seven point seven five more goals per game than their opponents not so good on the road they're below they're about at minus point one five uh, what's this team up here? There's Boston. Look at look at how well they do on the road, trouncing everyone else, but still do pretty well at home. So uh, this is a pretty graph. I like it. Unfortunately, it didn't quite fit all the teams on there. Um, these are the equations I showed you earlier. This is uh, to refresh your memory. Uh, you're basically taking so the x's and the y's are actual values. This is what you're trying to predict. These are the variables that you think can help predict that. So this could be house, you know, the lot size and the square footage of the house. And this is the sales price of the house. And then this is these are the uh, values that we're trying to estimate, the Bs. And we can estimate the Bs using this formula. And we generated, created this regression model in the earlier piece. Uh, I've changed it a bit uh, to <clears throat> handle the case where there are some of the so we're passing in three things we're passing in a list of y values a list of x1 values and a list of x2 values and then we're doing the calculation um, but i have to first remove observations with nils so if any of if, if for each record if any of these three values is nil we need to throw away all that that data and i won't go into how i did it here this is Probably not the cleanest way to do it, but it works. So this is uh, letting me throw away data that I don't want. And then I can uh, run this. Well, you can see I've already run this. I don't need to click enter again. What, I'm do what I did was I used as explanatory variables. Um, um, actually, what did I use? Oh, yeah, the first, the th we're passing in three things. Y is the first thing, and then X1 and X2. So... Goals, I'm trying to predict goals scored by a team in a game based on how many shots that team took and how many power play opportunities they had. And the values, the estimated B values we get. So this is the value for basically the average team just if they don't take any shots and they don't get any power play opportunities, on average they score 1.56 goals. doesn't make any sense. You'd have to sh have some shots to get any goals, but let's... <laughs> Uh, just that's what the data set's saying is that just by showing up you get 1.56 goals and then for every shot you take um, you you on average get an extra 0 0.033 goals and um, for every power play opportunity you get you get an extra 0 0.065 um, goals and so those numbers are both positive and they're they're reasonable uh they i, I mean i don't think they're super accurate you need, this model is terrible you need a better model with more variables and stuff to to actually try to predict anything but we want to keep this simple so you know these are quite reasonable expectations and then uh this tensor here 
you'll notice is 62,000 records long or 63,000 records long. And this is saying, okay, given, what, given that we know how many shots a team took in a game and how many power play opportunities they had in the game, this is how many goals we predict they should have gotten in that game. So, you know, this team in this game should have gotten 2.4 goals and this, this team in this game should have gotten 3.3 goals. So that's how this works. And we're on our last chart. Let's hopefully that makes this a good one. I don't even remember what this is, but hopefully we go out with a with a bang. All right, where's my data? There we go. All right, I, I don't know how exciting this is, but um, actually I don't even know why I did this. Oh, yeah, so here I'm transforming. I'm filtering based on Boston only. Uh, oh, so I took the full data set, which is all keywords. So this is the full keyword list with like 63,000 records. And I'm filtering. So instead of creating a new data set with just Boston, I'm filtering using this datum.hometeam equals Boston to just pull out Boston home games. Uh, and then I'm running the same calculation. And um, so this is just Boston home games. And it looks like... When we don't score any goals, we lose. And when we score a lot of goals, we win. I have the pop-up. And uh, when we score an intermediate number of goals, we could win or lose. And um, there does seem to be an upward to the right trend here. So I wish I had plotted a regression line, but there, it looks like more shots leads to more goals. So thank you for coming to this extensive, long Elixir Zone. Um, my heart, again, goes out to everyone affected by this absolute tragedy in Ukraine. I, um, it's been, it's been, I'm not even directly affected in any way, shape, or form. And it's been an extremely tough week for me just watching millions of people's lives get uprooted, people getting killed. It's horrific. And, you know, going through this seems almost pointless, but it's not. It's part of life, um, and uh, I wish for the best for everyone affected by this tragedy. Um, very much hope that it comes to a as happy a conclusion as possible in as soon a time as possible. Um, most of the world has rallied around Ukraine, and I hope things turn out well. Thank you for coming to Elixir Zone.